Good morning. I want to welcome everyone and thank Secretary Becerra for joining with us. We're holding today's remote hearing in compliance with the rules and regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. Before we begin, I want to remind members of a few procedures to keep these proceedings running smoothly. First, consistent with regulations, the committee will keep microphones muted to limit background noise. Members are responsible for unmuting themselves when they seek recognition or when recognized for their five minutes. Committee staff will mute members only in the event of inadvertent background noise. In addition, when members are present in the proceeding, they must have their cameras on. If you need to step away to attend another proceeding, please turn your camera and audio off rather than logging out of the platform. And finally, in the event that I experience technical difficulties or need momentarily to step away from the hearing, Congresswoman Del Bene is authorized to serve as chair. And with that, we will turn to the topic of today's hearing, the President's proposed fiscal 2022 budget with Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Becerra. Let me extend a warm welcome to you, Mr. Secretary. And I know I speak on behalf of all members of this committee as we offer that welcome. After nearly a year and a half of devastation, economic uncertainty, and loss of more than half a million American lives, we meet today in a moment of renewed optimism as our nation continues to make significant strides in eradicating COVID-19. Thanks to President Biden's leadership and the diligence of public health officials, health workers, and everyday Americans, coronavirus cases, hospitalizations, and deaths have dropped dramatically. This progress is in no small part due to the administration's effort to make vaccines available to all Americans over the age of 12. However, vaccine availability is different from vaccine administration and there's still much work to be done to reduce hesitancy and combat misinformation regarding the vaccine. I'm impressed with the creative steps the administration is taking to encourage Americans to get vaccinated, as well as the efforts to eliminate barriers to the shot, such as lack of childcare or transportation. Another critical issue that threatens the health of all Americans, it's also the target that we all understand of misinformation. And as it relates to climate change, climate change is real. It's a tremendous threat to our planet and to the health of all people. Secretary Becerra, I recently sent you a letter asking HHS to pursue a policy and regulatory changes that tackle climate change and promote sustainability. The healthcare sector can and must do more to reduce its carbon emissions and make its infrastructure more sustainable. The, there are opportunities for this committee and your agency to work together in this matter, and I certainly look forward to your partnership. A topic that I know is near and dear to your heart is the Affordable Care Act, a law that I am proud to say this committee played a lead role in authoring. In your short tenure at HHS, Mr. Secretary, you've already shown how the ACA can continue to expand its reach and its positive impacts. 31 million Americans now have health coverage through the ACA, thanks to our accomplishments over these last 11 years. And more than a million additional people in our country gained coverage through the marketplaces over the last four months. There's still more work to be done. For example, 12 states still have not adopted the law's Medicaid expansion, leaving millions of vulnerable people without coverage for, in many cases, purely political reasons. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we can ensure everyone who needs coverage gets it. I was pleased that we recently improved the advanced premium tax credit to help people afford their plans, but we need to make these investments permanent. That's the kind of action we can take to grow the, uh, the insured population and to help those who are covered thanks to the ACA stay covered. While the Affordable Care Act certainly has helped reduce Americans' health care costs, many people still fall victim to surprise medical billing unexpectedly facing exorbitantly high charges for their care. At the end of last year, Congress acted to address this crisis with the passage of bipartisan legislation to protect patients from these surprise bills. I certainly want to thank Ranking Member Brady as we work together to ensure that the solution that Congress ultimately came up with was a balanced approach centered around strong consumer protections. Now it is up to HHS to implement the law and I know and hope that you will work closely with us as you proceed. Another area where your agency must take urgent action is nursing home safety and quality. 
The pandemic's horrific impact on these facilities laid bare the longstanding problems and challenges that exist in that industry. I spoke with your predecessor many times about this topic and sent him a number of letters on the matter. Unfortunately, there was too little reform. I'm counting on you to make the necessary regulatory changes as Congress legislates. Just as the pandemic illuminated serious problems plaguing nursing homes, it also brought to the fore a variety of substantial challenges that have confronted working families in the United States for many, many years. A lack of paid leave and inadequate access to affordable quality childcare are issues that existed long before COVID struck. Which means Democrats recently released the Building an Economy for Families Act. Our draft proposal is to make sure the economy works for working families. HHS will be responsible for implementing many of the policies we put forward and I know we can count on you to prioritize these changes that will make our economy stronger, more inclusive, and more resilient. And lastly, let me address an issue that touches every single topic that I've raised this morning, and it's one that I know you and the President care deeply about. That topic is equity. The Ways and Means Committee has become a leader in attempting to address these inequities in our healthcare system and society more broadly. I'm pleased that we've done quite a bit of bipartisan work on the matter, and I commend our committee members from both sides of the aisle who have led our rural and underserved communities health care task force, as well as those who lead our racial equity initiative. One specific equity re related matter I know that we want to raise, and that is the need to increase diversity in our physician workforce. I'd like to get your commitment to support a pipeline to practice program that would grow the number of minority doctors in the United States. This issue requires urgent attention and I plan to introduce legislation on this in the near future. I know my comments have covered a lot of ground, but in truth, they've only begun to scratch the surface of the myriad challenges confronting our nation and your agency in particular. I am pleased to see such an esteemed Ways and Means alum at the head of the HHS at this pivotal time. I look forward to your partnership as we work together to improve the health and well being of the American people. With that, let me recognize Ranking Member Brady for the purpose of an opening. Thank you, Chairman Deal, for holding this important hearing. And it's always good to welcome back a friend and former colleague of the House Ways and Means Committee, Secretary Becerra. But let's begin by taking a look at the health of the economy. Even though President Biden inherited a strong recovery, life-saving vaccines, and a reopening economy, he is sabotaging the jobs recovery with crippling tax increase proposals that hurt working families slow hiring, and drive U.S. jobs overseas. Proof is in the April-May jobs report, the first of which was a major economic setback, and the recent which fell far short of even dumbed down jobs expectations. Long-term unemployment is worse today than it was before the pandemic, and labor force participation has regressed to the 1970s. To put it in perspective, despite all the advantages he inherited, including trillions of new stimulus spending during her, his first five months, President Biden is half a million jobs short of what President Trump achieved in his last five months, most of which was during the height of the COVID deaths. The Washington Post recently gave President Biden two Pinocchios for his false claims about job creation. It's clear we don't need more stimulus, we need better economic policies. Despite our differences, our committees worked hard to find common ground, as the chairman said, in health care, foster care, Medicare improvements, telehealth, COVID aid, maternal mortality, helping the underserved and rural communities, and most recently leading a first ever national ban on surprise medical bills. Regrettably, though, this hearing reveals a budget that is truly partisan. After a massive pandemic, President Biden insists on putting Washington in charge of Americans' personal health decisions, even when it means canceling their private health insurance through Medicare for All, fewer cures for devastating diseases through HR3, imposing costly new one-size-fits-all mandates on Main Street businesses, ignoring the looming insolvency of Medicare, creating new entitlements that require dramatically higher payroll taxes on workers and puts the IRS in charge of your time off, and doubling down on the fatally flawed Affordable Care Act. The fact is Americans don't trust Washington 
with their life and death medical decisions. They oppose a socialist takeover of their health care. And they know that good paying jobs and growing wages do far more for working families than one size fits all Washington mandates and permanently smaller paychecks. Americans also don't want lower drug prices at the expense of future cures for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, diabetes, and cancer as Democrats rush through the House in HR 3. They want Congress to work together to deliver lower drug prices and more life-saving cures as Republicans proposed in the bipartisan HR 19. President Biden's budget ignores the looming insolvency of Medicare without meaningful reforms to address the fact that this program is just five years away from going broke. Instead, Democrats make it worse by expanding the program beyond today's seniors, jeopardizing the Medicare guarantee that seniors paid a lifetime into. The possibility that telehealth benefits may soon be stripped from those who relied on it to get through the COVID pandemic, another problem ignored in the Biden budget. This budget ignores the failures of the Affordable Care Act and seems to acknowledge that Obamacare has done little to address rising health care costs. And that's why the Biden budget spends another $160 billion over the next decade without addressing the real problem of continuing rising costs. The budget includes two new entitlement programs that will cost more than half a trillion dollars just in the first decade. And oh yes, for the first time, puts the IRS in charge of your time off from work while permanently shrinking the paychecks of every worker, whether they use paid medical leave or not. President Biden and the Vice President also continue to ignore the dangerous border crisis that treats so many young children cruelly, putting their lives at risk in the hands of dangerous coyotes. Now we're seeing America's foster children also hurt as the Biden administration diverts congressionally allocated health care and foster care funds that push America's foster kids out of their homes to make way for migrant children. This crisis has made its way into communities across the country and it's making worse the challenges facing our foster care system. Just last month, nearly 300 children in Texas had to seek shelter in an office, a hotel, or a church because there were no open beds in our current foster care system. I hope that you, Secretary Becerra, as we discussed, can shed some light on the agency's handling of the crisis and ensuring the well being of the more than 100, or excuse me, 18,000 unaccompanied kids in your care. There is too much stake at stake to get this wrong. I know that we can agree on this. Whether we're talking about foster kids, childcare, healthcare, Medicare, or life-saving cures, President Biden's budget, in our view, is the last thing Americans need. We should and could go a different way. We can tackle enormous challenges by working together. And I hope that's what we do. Secretary Becerra, welcome back to the committee and Chairman Neal. I hope we can take a step in that direction today. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Brady. And without objection, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. Our witness today really needs no introduction. Secretary Becerra is the 25th Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. He served 12 terms as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. He was a member of this committee from 1997 until he was appointed Attorney General for the state of California in 2017. Secretary, we appreciate your presence here this morning. We received your written testimony and it will be made part of the record in its entirety. I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. And to help with that time, please keep an eye on the clock that should be pinned to your screen. I will notify you when your time has expired. Mr. Secretary. Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be back with so many friends and familiar faces to discuss the President's 2022 budget for the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, this department is at the center of many challenges facing our country. The COVID-19 pandemic has shed light on how health inequities and inefficient federal funding can leave communities vulnerable to crises. Now more than ever, we must ensure that HHS has the resources to achieve its mission and build a healthier America. For HHS, the budget proposes $131.7 billion in discretionary budget authority and $1.5 trillion in mandatory funding. 
This budget underscores the administration's commitment to prepare the nation for the next public health crisis, to expand access to affordable health care, to address health disparities, to tackle the opioid and other drug crises, and to invest in other priority areas like maternal health, tribal health, and early childhood education. Of course, the fight against COVID-19 is not yet over, but even as HHS works to beat this pandemic, we must also prepare for the next public health crisis. To start, the budget makes significant investments in our preparedness and response capabilities, including by investing in the strategic national stockpile and the public health workforce. It provides a mandatory, a new mandatory funding stream for the manufacture of medical countermeasures. Here at home, uh, to protect Americans from future pandemic and to create U.S. jobs. The budget also includes the largest fiscal year investment in the CDC in almost two decades. The budget reflects the president's commitment to expanding access to quality, affordable health care for all Americans. It builds on the groundbreaking reforms introduced in the American Rescue Plan by permanently extending the enhanced premium subsidies that put affordable health care coverage within reach for millions more Americans. The budget also expands access to home and community-based services under Medicaid, critical services that allow older Americans and our loved ones with disabilities to live independently in their homes and communities. And the budget calls on Congress to take additional steps this year to lower the cost of prescription drugs and further expand and improve health coverage through additional benefits and public coverage options. Healthcare must be a right, not a privilege, and I will work to ensure that families across the nation are able to secure the health care they need. As we work to expand access to affordable health care and address the challenges of COVID-19 and future pandemics, we need to address public health crises that are already here, like violence in our communities and climate change. The president's budget increases funding to support domestic violence survivors. It addresses gun violence by doubling funding for firearm violence prevention research, and it allows HHS to play a major role in the administration's government-wide efforts to tackle the climate crisis by supporting research and programs identifying the human health impacts of climate change and establishing here at HHS an Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. To ensure that HHS is equitably serving all Americans, the budget invests in reducing maternal mortality and morbidity that disproportionately impacts women of color. It builds on the American Rescue Plan state option to extend Medicaid postpartum coverage it funds a range of rural health care programs and expands the pipeline of rural health providers. And it includes a dramatic funding increase and advanced appropriations for the Indian Health Service. It invests as well in improving access to vital reproduction and, re and preventative care services through Title X. Now, to support families and build the best possible future for our children, the budget makes major investments to ensure high quality child care is affordable for low and middle income families and to provide high quality pre-K for all three and four year olds. We know our, our experiences as children shape the adults we become. Support in childhood leads to success in the future. To address COVID-19's unprecedented acceleration of substance use and mental health disorders, the budget makes historic investments in SAMHSA to support research, prevention, treatment, and recovery support services. To support innovation and research, the budget increases funding for NIH by $9 billion, $6.5 billion of which will go to establish the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, ARPA-H, with an initial focus on cancer and other diseases such as diabetes and Alzheimer's. This major investment in federal research and development will leverage ambitious ideas to build transformational innovation through health research and the application and implementation of health breakthroughs. Finally, to ensure our funds are used appropriately, the budget invests in program integrity, including efforts to combat fraud, waste, and abuse in Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to close with recognizing the women and men at HHS for their outstanding and tireless work fighting COVID-19 to protect the health of their fellow Americans. To build back a prosperous America, we need a healthy America. We've taken important steps over the past few months to beat back this pandemic, to expand access to quality health care, and to lower health care premiums and to protect women's health at home and abroad. President Biden's budget builds on that progress, and I thank you for this time.
can't hear you. What's going on? I think the chairman's muted. Some pressure to accommodate both institutions today. Mr. Chairman, I believe you were unmuted. We didn't catch what you said. I mean, you were okay. muted. We didn't catch what you said. Let's try it again. No, not yet. Oh, there we go. Okay. Right. So without objection, each member will be recognized for four minutes to question our witness so that we may ensure that all members have the opportunity to inquire before the secretary is scheduled to leave. He has to be with the Senate this afternoon and consistent with committee practice in these remote settings. We will be with the Gibbons rule and we'll go in order of seniority. Between majority and minority members, I will begin right by recognizing myself. And I want to emphasize, I will bring the gavel down in four minutes. The secretary has asked for that courtesy. We should extend it. I share the administration's commitment, Mr. Secretary, to address coverage gaps for low-income people caused by some states who have refused to expand Medicaid, and you and I have talked about the need to address this issue. You, and I know your answer, but I want to get it on the record as well, that these two to four million Americans cannot wait any longer for coverage, and the Congress should find the most expeditious path to go forward. Mr. Chairman, uh, we agree completely with the administration that we must continue to expand Healthcare, as you know, today, 31 million Americans have received health care through the Affordable Care Act. That's a historic number. And over the last three months, as a result of the special enrollment period issued by the president, more than a million uh, Americans were able to receive their health care coverage. So we will continue to expand that, whether it's under Medicaid, whether it's under the marketplace. We want to explore all these opportunities to continue to give uh, all Americans the opportunity to have health care as a right, not just a privilege. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, similar to our Ways and Means discussion draft of the Building an Economy for Families Act, the President's budget proposes a historic investment in child care to make it more affordable and available, upgrade child care infrastructure to make it better and safer, and raise wages for child care workforce, which is, we know, predominantly women of color. Secretary Becerra, we stand ready to work with you on this crucial part of the President's plan for a strong economic recovery. Could you tell us more about how making this long-term investment in child care, as well as short-term rescue efforts in the ARPA, is still needed to support workers and families? Mr. Chairman, uh, first let me begin by thanking you and this committee for your work in building an, uh, on the Building an Economy for Families Act, which I know is crucial if we're going to continue to move forward to help our children. Uh, our budget proposes Three and a half billion dollars in budget authority for the Child Care and Act uh, entitlement uh, of 2022. Uh, it provides for further investments in our workforce in the child care field. We want to make sure that people can afford to work to take care of our kids. And we want to continue to give uh, Americans the opportunity to explore any job opportunities they like because they know they'll have quality, affordable health, uh, child care at their disposal. So we look forward to working with you to continue to expand access to quality child care for all Americans. The COVID Stop. Go. Mr. Secretary, the COVID-19 pandemic laid bare the longstanding inadequacy of our current protections for nursing home staff, residents, and their families. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services can take immediate actions to shore up existing protections and make long-term investments such as improved staffing, oversight, and transparency. Could you speak to the actions HHS is currently taking to improve conditions for residents and staff at these facilities. And I know that we can count on you to advance these issues through regulations while we work on legislation to get these issues. Could you speak to that? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. We learned uh, from COVID-19 how much we need to do a better job at uh, being able to track what's going on in these various facilities. Our oversight capabilities must increase. We need to work closely with Congress so we know exactly how we can ensure that we are uh, providing to our families the protections that they deserve and have safety as a paramount concern. The president's budget requests $75 million to increase state survey agencies' uh, abilities to address additional pain, uh, complaints that might be lodged by patients to perform infection control surveys in nursing homes and uh, provide an annual mandated survey in nursing homes. So we intend to work with you to make sure that we do the proper oversight and accountability of these various facilities that that house our loved ones. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. 
Mr. Secretary, thank you. Now let me recognize uh, Mr. Brady, the ranking member, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. So would you yield a few minutes at this time to enter into a brief uh, call on the yes. topic of the bills? Yes. So for years too many patients, thank you, Chairman, for years too many patients and their families had their health problems compounded by an unexpected out-of-network surprise medical bill. Thanks to the tireless bipartisan work of this committee last Congress, this terrible practice was, will soon be no more. Now it's up to the Biden administration to implement this landmark bipartisan law. And given the key role of HHS in implementation, I want to reaffirm our shared priorities and those of the Ways and Means Committee while we have Secretary Becerra before us. As leaders of the Ways and Means Committee, we aim to protect patients' access to providers in their area. We also sought to take patients out of the process and avoid tipping the scales in favor of one party over another in determining the right payment and amount for out of network bills. This will enable independent arbiters to weigh all the relevant information in a given case and keeps the process from becoming a de facto rate setting system. The integrity of that arbitration process should be protected in as many ways as possible, including through robust transparency. I encourage the administration to ensure timely resolution of billing disputes in accordance with the tight timelines that we wrote into the bill. Healthcare providers deserve a guarantee of prompt payment upon resolution of these cases. Finally, I would encourage the administration not to neglect the bill's important transparency measures with a particular focus on the historic, advanced, honest, and true bill, the explanation of benefits provision. Giving patients information about the cost of their services ahead of time will help healthcare make sense. Nobody fills up their tank without knowing how much their gas costs. The same should be true of healthcare. Thankfully for patients and their families, this changes for the better next year. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you indulging me while we have the sector here before us. And of course, I look forward to continuing to work uh, our partnership on this important issue. And I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brady. And I want to fully associate myself with your remarks and would add that our shared priority during implementation is that patients must be protected from out-of-network surprise bills. Lawmakers did not design any intentional loopholes for, say, a patient to be handed a form when they're unconscious and then subsequently get a bill that they supposedly agreed to pay. The patient protection should be as tight as possible, and we look forward to continuing to engage with the administration as this law is rolled out. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, our, our secretary today. The gentleman's so, recognized. Thank you, Secretary Becerra. You know, I think there are several areas of common agreement here, including making uh, America medically independent from China in uh, crucial medicines, medical supplies, and ingredients to, ingredients to build that. I hope we can work together on issues like the underserved the poor, the rural, uh, as well as uh, is ensuring that telehealth, which was one of the saving graces in the COVID, uh, can become permanent uh, access and flexibility to connect our patients uh, with their healthcare providers. I also wanna talk about an area that really concerns me and I think others uh, in the country. This is the unaccompanied minors in HHS custody. Uncompanied minors have been streaming across the border in unprecedented numbers for months now. I've been there. There is a real crisis at our southern border. I'm concerned the administration is in denial about this and certainly has no plan to address this. So I've written two separate letters to you on this issue, and, I, and Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent both these letters be entered into the record. So ordered. You know, it's my understanding that children will be unified with sponsors, but a good number are not. And I want to focus on that. I believe it's roughly 10% of the unaccompanied migrant kids have no sponsor, need some sort of long-term foster care placement. The problem is our American foster care system is, is already overwhelmed and frankly, in some cases, is simply cruel. And given the significant increase in kids coming across the border over the last few months, in the knowledge that this is already hurting some of our U.S. foster kids as we try to get a roof over their head uh, in, in foster parents. What is your plan to 
uh, protect American foster kids uh, with this uh, system to anticipate and manage the increased need for long-term foster beds. First, Congressman Brady, great to see you and thank you for the questions. Very much looking forward to working with you, including on this issue uh, to trying to help our foster kids. Let me assure you that all the work that we're doing with regard to the unaccompanied migrant children, and we have responsibility for them to provide them with the health and safety while they're in this country, how, for however long that might end up being, we will not uh, let that impact the work that we all are doing to, to care for our foster children throughout the country. They, they run on two separate tracks, but the work we do with unaccompanied minors, uh, migrant uh, children, and that which we do with regard to foster care. And I want to assure you that we will continue to keep those separate. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And one that's terrific to hear, and I know you're sincere in this. So when, from a timetable standpoint, when might we see a plan on how we address this issue? One, where Republicans and Democrats can work together. Chairman, I, 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 Mr. Brady, I'm glad you're asking that question because we are, we're looking and the budget, our budget essentially telegraphs that we're looking to come up with long-term solutions. Uh, we know because previous administrations have gone through this, that the phenomenon of seeing migrant children at the border unaccompanied is not new. And so we intend to try to come up with a solution that doesn't let us have to gyrate through the, the, the process in a year to come up with uh, long-term solutions. We look forward to working with you. It is expensive anytime you have custody and uh, the need to provide health and safety to children. And so we look forward to working with you and coming up with some long-term solutions. Great, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brady. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, to inquire for four minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your important leadership. Uh, my home state of Texas, unfortunately, bears the disgraceful distinction of having more uninsured citizens, more uninsured children than any place in America. I was pleased to hear your comments earlier about your interest in addressing this problem. We've learned that as many as uh, 2 million Texans could get access to a family physician through extension of Medicaid. Unfortunately, Texas, as is true in 12 other states, ideology gets in the way of caring for citizens who are vulnerable and economically disadvantaged. You mentioned a couple of ideas already. I want to bring to your attention another one, and that is to authorize Medicaid, CMS, to contract directly with local governmental units in those states that have put ideology ahead of healthcare. Uh, this would be a way to have essentially a local option uh, to protect uh, vulnerable citizens and extend Medicaid to them on the same basis in a local area through a county, a hospital district, a city, as has occurred uh, in most states that exercise the good judgment of taking 100 uh, federal cents on the dollar uh, to extend Medicaid. Uh, have you considered this alternative, which I know has worked previously in your home state of California and some other places, an alternative that uh, will be included in legislation that I'll be introducing with uh, probably just about every Democratic member from the 13 uh, expansion states? I think we lost Mr. Doggett. Chairman, should we wait? Uh... Well, if we could, if he, we'll give him another couple of minutes and then we'll come back to him or at least allow him to finish his question and you to give the answer. What we'll do is we'll come back to uh, Mr. Doggett. Why don't we recognize uh, Mr. Nunez, gentleman from California. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate the time today. And thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your attendance today. To be prepared for the next pandemic, we must have robust domestic manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. And that's my topic here today. If we're going to continue to be the world's leader in innovation in numerous areas within the healthcare sector, we can't leave ourselves or our international partners vulnerable to China 
when it comes to this critical issue. This is why I introduced two bills in the last Congress to incentivize domestic manufacturing. It is also why I'm concerned about the Biden administration's support for the TRIPS waiver, which would force American innovators of COVID vaccines to share their proprietary information with foreign nations, including China, Russia, and other hostile regimes. Because the waiver clearly jeopardizes the future development of vaccines and cures in the United States, today I introduced another bill to require that the administration consult with Congress, analyze all the implications, and protect U.S. national security before waiving any intellectual property protections for vaccines. I recognize that USTR is leading the waiver negotiations, but the HHS should play a central role in analyzing the waiver's effects uh, in both the United States and globally. It's, it's critical that we assist the global distribution of COVID vaccines, but a TRIPS waiver, which is opposed by allies like Germany, would take years before yielding large numbers of vaccine doses abroad. So I'm disappointed with the administration's announced support for this waiver without consulting Congress, but I will continue to press for the consultations and robust analysis that are needed to justify the decision with such significant implications for our health and national security. And with that, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, what I'll do is I'm just gonna ask two questions for the record and and uh, you can either answer them now, if we, but if we run out of time, uh, you can answer for the record. But once again, I appreciate you being here, but uh, I have two questions. Uh, that are fairly simple and straightforward. The first is, has HHS conducted any analysis of the impact of any waiver of intellectual property on domestic manufacturing or innovation? That's the first question. The second question is, is has HHS conducted any analysis of how long it will take foreign nations to manufacture and distribute COVID vaccines if this TRIPS waiver is granted? That's my second question. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but uh, if the Secretary has time, he's more than well, uh, welcome to answer. If not, I'll take him for the record. I appreciate that. Go, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, great to see you. And uh, let me try to give you a response, and I can always follow up if you'd like. First, uh, on the TRIPS waiver, please, uh, let's recognize that the President has said he is willing to open that uh, to negotiations. There is no done deal. Nothing is set in, in stone. Uh, there still has to be negotiation to figure out how textually that would look. And so what I can say to you as someone who have, as you has, has worked in the past on these issues involving intellectual property and the protection of our, our own rights as Americans, uh, we will make sure that we're protecting those property rights as we always have in the WTO. Uh, what I will say to you is that whether we get to some negotiated language that allows us to move forward with vaccines, uh, will depend on the negotiations that have to take place on that TRIPS language. Secondly, with regard to domestic manufacturing, I think there's a, a great deal of bipartisan support to move in enhancing our uh, abilities to manufacture here at home. And the American Rescue Plan provided $10 billion for us to, to do that, to increase that domestic capacity. And so we hope to work with Congress to put that into uh, fruition to make sure that we have American manufacturers, whether it's for masks, PPE, vaccines, yes, to the degree, degree possible, we do it here at home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Secretary. Let us return to Mr. Doggett. Lloyd, are you ready? You're on mute, Lloyd. Mr. Doggett, you're on mute. Okay, so we'll come back to you again, Mr. Okay. Doggett. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. I, I was asking the secretary about his reaction to uh, allowing local governments to contract directly with CMS as one option to meet this great gap of the uninsured. Congressman Doggett, first, uh, great to see you again, and thank you for always pushing so hard on some, some of these matters. Uh, as the president has said, we're gonna do everything we can to expand access to care. There are any number of great ideas to do that. Thanks for the work that you've been doing. Uh, you mentioned how states like California have taken advantage of these waiver opportunities. Uh, we look forward to working with you because at the end of the day, what we wanna do is say that more Americans are covered. And as I mentioned in my in previous responses to some questions, today, 31 million Americans have coverage through the Affordable Care Act. Uh, some of them through the uh, Medicaid expansion, others through the marketplaces, 
we look forward to working with you to figure out a way to continue that growth. And with regard to uh, prescription drug pricing, is it important that our legislation not discriminate against the uninsured, that we provide benefits to them? Again, Congressman Doggett, th thank you for being dogged in this, uh, because you are right. Like you, I agree that we want to make sure everyone has a, a chance to participate and to benefit from lower drug prices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. Uh, let me now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us. It's good to see you back in the Ways and Means space. Uh, and I've, I've got two questions, and I'll I'll give them both to you, and then you can respond. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to start by talking about telemedicine. It's been one of the silver linings in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm proud to have founded the Congressional Telehealth Caucus, which is a bipartisan group, and we're working to ensure that high-quality telehealth services are available to all Americans. And um, it was my partisan legislation that was signed into law at the start of COVID that authorized Medicare to expand telehealth uh, for the duration of the pandemic. Unfortunately, uh, the telehealth flexibilities currently in place are going to expire uh, once uh, we get out of this public health emergency. And uh, I've introduced uh, another piece of legislation along with my friend, uh, Mr. Swikert on, on this uh, committee that will ensure that patients can continue accessing telehealth services. So my first question would be, can you talk about how you view the next steps for telehealth and how does the administration envision incorporating telehealth into the Medicare uh, program? And then second, uh, you know, we've got this just huge number of ongoing mental health challenges uh, in our country. Uh, substance abuse, uh, addiction, uh, homelessness, suicide, self-harm, depression, that just goes on and on and on. And we see the impacts of, the, of these cries all around us in the homeless population or our prisons and jails, amongst our veteran population, and amongst our teenagers. And I've got legislation that would expand uh, mental health services for seniors in Medicare, but it's going to take a lot more than that. Um, I'd like to know how HHS is approaching uh, this challenge. And can you talk a little bit more about your efforts underway uh, as secretary uh, in your department to combat uh, mental health? Dr. Thompson, great to see you again. Look forward to visiting in your district and in imbibing of that uh, refreshment that you all have there that's so so popular at some point. Um, let, let me start with the second question first, Congressman, if I may. Uh, we recently announced $3 billion that we would be putting out as a result of the American Rescue Plan that you all helped push through the finish line that will let us put money into mental health services with SAMHSA and also for substance use disorder services. Uh, major investments never would have been possible without your support, and, and we're going to put that to work immediately. Secondly, to the question about telehealth, wow, do, do we get to learn things from COVID-19, right? And telehealth was one of the real benefits of seeing how we could adapt. And so now it's a matter of figuring out how we can deploy some of that long term, because as you said, some of the authorities will expire. We look forward to working with you because some of that authority will have to come through statute. Some of that we can probably do through administrative regulation, but what we do know is we can't go back to the old way of doing business. We have to take advantage of telehealth. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. And I, I just wanna close by saying that so many of the problems that we face today are tied to mental health. And you talk about homelessness and the addiction problems. If you can't get mental health uh, care, you're gonna, you're gonna turn to whatever you can for relief. And sadly, self-medication with drugs and alcohol is often uh, what folks turn to. So we really need, in a bipartisan way, to redouble our efforts to deal with the mental health challenge uh, that faces every one of our communities on a daily basis. Uh, thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Welcome back, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I want to touch on uh, the idea of affordability. You mentioned it. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we were talking about bending the curve. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, 
have little or no insurance, but I want to talk about another group of folks, small businesses, uh, and many of them, they've seen their costs go up over the last five or six years, 20% a year. A lot of it, not all of it, gets passed to the employees. Historically, for someone that's been in business a long time, I've always shared first 20 years, myself, a lot of companies paid everybody's insurance. The big corporations can afford to do that today for many of their employees. But a lot of the small businesses, they can't afford $1,400 a month for a family of four. So they'll pay six or 700. It gets pushed to the middle class, the working folks. Uh, and that's why they're so financially stressed out, borderline bankruptcy. I've seen it. So I guess, Mr. Secretary, how can we all work together? I know it's a, you've got a lot of challenges, but there's probably in this category 60 to 80 million people that are chipping in where many people in the past didn't have to as much as seven, eight hundred dollars a month uh, out of their own pay. And uh, so it's very concerning. I was chairman of the Florida uh, Chamber. It was a big issue back then. It's a more critical issue today. And a lot of them are in, working in restaurants or in small businesses. They can't afford to absorb all the the increases. So a lot of that's getting pushed to the working people in the middle class. And I'm very concerned about, you know, many of them just financially going bankrupt or completely stressed out, or they don't take the insurance because they can't afford the deductibility or their contribution. So I know you touched on affordability. Uh, what's your thoughts? Congressman Buchanan, first, uh, Great to see you, and, and thank you for always championing the cause of uh, small businessmen and women. I know that that's been a, a mantra of yours for a long time. And you're right, because so many of those small businessmen and women don't even have their own health insurance. What we're hoping to do is make it more possible for people to be able to afford it, have the, the choices. Uh, as I said, today, more Americans are using the Affordable Care Act than ever before, 31 million. In this special enrollment period that President Biden uh, initiated about three months ago. We've seen more than a million people take advantage. So many of those folks lost their insurance. So many of those folks work for small businesses where it's tough to provide the healthcare coverage. And so what, what I can tell you is that I am absolutely interested in working with you and others, uh, especially if you're trying to get to that the middle of America that oftentimes gets squeezed and, and, and doesn't quite get to benefit from some of the proposals that are out there. So Look forward to working with you on that and continuing the growth that, as we've seen under President Biden, of people in America who can get quality, affordable health care. Well, I appreciate. I'd like to work with you, but I, I just want to also just keep those folks in mind. Uh, a lot of the people that are employees of small businesses, they are stressed out uh, in terms of trying to pay for their health care. It's a big issue. I see it. Uh, and again, looking back, we used to pay everybody. Now we're paying a little over half. Our employees are paying the other half. My sons are running those businesses and I don't like it. I just don't, you know, because it's money that they can't afford to do. So it's a big issue. I just want you to give them some consideration. I don't know how much time I got, but I did want to ask one quick question in terms of your budget. You're looking at a 23% increase, uh, you know, to me running the math, 20 billion plus. Where is the majority of those dollars going to be focused in terms of the next year? When you look at inflation at four or five percent, and you're looking to get 23 percent, I'm just concerned. Everybody wants more spending, but at some point, you got to pay for this stuff. Congressman, so much of the money that's coming in is going to be invested in some of the behavioral health issues that I just previously spoke about. How we deal with mental health, substance use disorder issues. So much of what we're going to need to do to recover from from COVID. And also, I should mention the fact that the president is making sure that those middle income Americans, so small business people who would fall off the cliff, cliff of coverage in terms of a subsidy, if we're able to make this uh, expanded uh, support on the subsidy permanent, millions of Americans who are in the middle, a lot of those small business men and women are going to be able to keep their insurance because they will no longer fall off the cliff when they get to a certain income level and all of a sudden lose those subsidies. So much of the money is invested to improve health care and make sure we tackle all those health issues that we're seeing as a result of COVID. Thank, Thank you, you, Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blumenauer, the gentleman from Oregon is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. And Mr. Secretary, it's such a pleasure to welcome you back to the committee. 
Uh, we look forward to working with you uh, and the administration in this critical function. Um, the president's health care budget demonstrates his deep commitment to the health and well-being of Americans. Our health care system faces significant challenges, uh, including the coming exhaustion of the Medicare trust fund uh, and increasing cost of health care, lack of choices for individuals with serious illness and at the end of life. I'm pleased to see the president's budget would make significant investments in the Affordable Care Act insurance subsidies. However, making health care itself more affordable by increasing public subsidy does not reduce the cost of health care itself. Without changing the payment model, the cost will continue to increase, forcing us to spend ever more money on medical care, but undermining investments in the social determinants of health that are so critical if we're going to be able to deal with long-standing health disparities that disproportionately affect people of color. Furthermore, governors, even in Medicaid expansion states, will be hard-pressed to maintain existing coverage without a way to reduce the cost of care. Given the constraints of reconciliation, it will be difficult to address medical inflation through congressional action alone. The use of facilitated 11, 15, and 1332 waivers offers a path for a carefully selected states to expand on the work currently being pioneered in my home state of Oregon and in Maryland, which are demonstrating innovative ways to reduce the total cost of care while maintaining access, benefits, and quality. Would you be willing to consider a waiver strategy as an administrative complement to the legislative initiatives being pursued? Congressman Blumenauer, uh, as you know, this administration is willing to look under every rock that uh, any member of Congress puts before us to see if there's a better solution for health care. We want to continue to expand coverage. We want to continue to lower costs. So if you and your colleagues come up with some good ideas when it comes to prescription drugs, on better access, on innovation, on bending the curve, we're willing to listen. And I know that you have a number of good ideas in your pocket. I'd love to continue to work with you on these things because at the end of the day, what President Biden simply wants is to make sure that Americans don't have to worry uh, about whether they should pay the rent or be able to send their child to see the doctor. And uh, we all have to have that peace of mind. We look forward to working with you on that. I, I appreciate that very much and would look forward to exploring what has happened with the waiver strategy uh, as a way to deal with the total cost of care. Uh, and I hope that we could explore that together. One other thing you recall from your days on this committee when we were dealing with the Affordable Care Act, I was deeply concerned about the about end of life care and how uh, we had problems. You remember with the phony uh, uh, controversy over death panels, but we finally got the opportunity for the federal government to invest in those uh, that uh, end of life care. But there's very low utilization right now. Uh, do you have any thoughts about what we might do to enhance the opportunity for American families to make sure they get the care they want in those vulnerable times? That one's, uh, 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 that's an issue near and dear to me, Congressman, because my father, who lived with me his last four years of life, uh, had his family surrounding him the day he died uh, about a, a year and a half ago. And you would hope that everyone would have an opportunity to be able to have more say in their healthcare, especially towards the end of their life. Uh, those decisions are tough. My state has made, as your state has made advances in that regard. I look forward to working with you to see how we can do something at the federal level. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Secretary, good to see you again. You're looking quite well. Hey, uh, what? My question is, and we only have four minutes, but I, I've sent a couple of letters to you. I'm going to ask Mr. Chairman that they be submitted uh, into the record. Uh, my big question, uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania, we had a number of our unaccompanied children uh, show up there. Uh, when I found out they were there, I made a call and I went up to Erie to see them and they told me, don't, you don't need to come up, they're already gone. And my question comes down to, uh, do we have any way we can look at what the contract is for people who are taking care of these children. It's a big operation. 
Now, the kids that were in Erie, Pennsylvania, were only there for a couple of days. After I was told they weren't going to be there at all because the facility wasn't ready for them, uh, 150 kids, about 175 to 180 staff members to take care of them. Within two or three days, they were all gone. Uh, some of them had COVID. Uh, and my question to you, and I know you're busy, and I know you're not going to be able to answer this now because of our time, would you please get back to me at these emergency intake sites? What is the contract? I've been told it's anywhere from $750 to $800 per day per child that, that the cost of operating. It's a huge operation. I was down in Donna, Texas. Incredible job that we did setting up a tent city to take care of these children. I watched the implementation of it, but I, I would really like to see going forward, what is the policy going to be? What is the process going to be? And what does the contract look like? I can't get any information. I know you're busy, we sent you a couple of letters. I would really appreciate it. I, I know, I don't expect you to answer this right now, okay? I mean, this is, this is, this is like Jesus on Holy Thursday. You're getting it from all sides. Uh, let's just do this. If you can get back to me as soon as possible, I would really appreciate it. I know the people in Erie didn't understand what happened. Uh, they were very welcoming, by the way, to have these children there. But Mr. Secretary, they're only there a couple of days and then they were all gone. So going forward, the policy, the process and the cost and what the, and what the contract looks like. Guys, so great to see you. And I, I, you still have the same energy. It's great to see. Great to see. And absolutely, we will follow up. You are absolutely right. The folks in Erie were very welcoming. Uh, we have an obligation to make sure we take care of these kids and provide them with the safety and health that, that that's required. Uh, we work with our partners. We, we follow the federal acquisition uh, regulations when it comes to contracting. Rather than try to get into detail because of the time constraint, let's follow up. But what I can tell you is this, we make every effort to make sure that any site that we stand up will provide the safety and the uh, health needs of those uh, migrant children for however long they're gonna be in this country. Who knows what their status will end up being. But we have an obligation to make sure that they are cared for. We're gonna do it the right way. And we thank those communities that are willing to help us out. We've had a lot of folks come forward, donate supplies and toys and gifts. And the folks in Erie were very gracious as well. Yeah, well, that's great. If you can get back to me if, on what that contract looks like with the providers of those those services. So, Mr. Secretary, good seeing you. Stay healthy. I'm glad to work with you, and I'm really looking forward on this, this issue to make sure we just keep moving forward. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Secretary, thank you. We thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from, from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquale, to inquire. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Mr. Good morning. Secretary. <laughs> good to see you. You look healthy, stay healthy. Uh, I appreciate your work in the Biden administration's efforts to invest in public health and health care. Many priorities in the budget, like strengthening the ACA and lowering drug costs and expanding Medicare, they're long overdue. So here are my questions. The FDA supports a unique device identification system. And we've been putzing around with devices for the last 10 years. And we're finally, mo hopefully moving on it. References, uh, that uh, identification system references benefits in the claims data to improve implant safety and reduce costs. However, the CMS budget justification makes no mention of this change. Please describe the administration's plan to utilize the unique device identifier information being collected for Medicare and Medicaid programs and how the information will be used for quality measurement. And will you encourage the adoption of new electronic claim standards under HIPAA, H-I-P-A-A, -A, that include unique device information? Congressman, first, uh, great to see you. Secondly, thank you for being tenacious always. These are, these are issues that oftentimes no, most people don't know about, get ignored, but they are critical, especially when it comes to making sure that we uh, properly are uh, following the patient, making sure we have all the right information on them. the unique device identifiers that you mentioned you know, are something they're working their way through the process. And my understanding is at this stage that 
Right now, they're before the National Committee, the it's called the Vital and Health Statistics, uh, National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics. They're, they're waiting to get through that process to get the recommendation from that committee to move forward. But uh, what I can do is I can follow up with you as we uh, wait to hear from this, this committee to find out where that stands. But as you as you mentioned, we've got to make sure that through these medical claim, uh, Medicare claims that we can track these things and that uh, unique device identifier is one way to do that. It helps us in the examining also, Mr. Secretary, the device itself. There are many different devices, you know better than I do. And these devices uh, need oversight in terms of what they do to the human body. And we're finding more and more out, and a lot of other companies don't like the idea, a lot of companies. Uh, the second question was, Wall Street's tentacles in our healthcare system continues to grow. We talked about this a lot when you were around here. Their control is associated with surprise billing, sky high nursing home, death rates, we can't accept that. The shuttering of safety net hospitals, all in the name of profit, not patients. So Ways and Means Oversight Subcommittee hearing revealed, not that long ago, a disturbing lack of transparency. We heard about declining standards and lower quality of care, a lot of those horror stories, from hospitals and nursing homes owned by private equity firms. I'd like your not only nursing homes. I'd like your take on that. With the short time that remains, Congressman, what I'll tell you is that I, I am prepared to work with you. I took this on as Attorney General in California. Our obligation has to be to the residents first and foremost, and we have to have transparency and accountability in, in these uh, facilities. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Reed, is recognized to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's great to see you again, Mr. Secretary, on the here at the committee. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, I just want to try to get two quick questions in. Uh, one is a very uh, heavy concern about drug pricing takeover that HR3 represents and uh, what the president has supported in his budget. And one of the things that I'm greatly concerned about is the incorporation of the quality adjusted life years in setting drug prices from foreign countries uh, in American drug pricing uh, um, uh, policy. And uh, I just wanted to see, uh, Secretary, if you could commit today uh, to us, to this committee, uh, that uh, HHS will not use quality adjusted life years to set drug prices in the U.S. either directly or by proxy uh, during your tenure as secretary at HHS. Congressman, first, good to see you, and I, I, I love your office. Uh, it's <laughs> I love it, too. <laughs> I love it. The, the thing that uh, uh, technology lets us do, right, uh, have these calls in space. So first, let me just say, I look forward to working with you. You know President Biden has made it very clear. We're going to do everything we can to try to uh, bring down the cost of prescription medicines. And so we're going to look at everything, but we will absolutely work with you and your colleagues to make sure that what we do is done right, that everyone feels that it's fair and it's accountable. So let me just make sure that we're in touch if you'd like, if you'd like to work on this issue. I definitely look forward to working with you. And I know, you know, in, in energy and commerce, we, you had a conversation with uh, my colleague, Kathy McMorris Rogers on this issue. And just want to make sure that uh, uh, that quality adjusted life years uh, does not become the de facto or de jure policy uh, of your office in setting drug prices here nationally, uh, which would be, a, a, I think, a, a very difficult or very problematic uh, policy for America to establish uh, in regards to um, its drug pricing uh, policy. The other issue I wanted to get to, and I got two minutes left here, uh, impacts our district. And that is the issue of critical access hospital uh, reimbursement, reimbursement uh, uh, policy. Uh, you know, I think in your confirmation testimony uh, that there is a question uh, of the mileage uh, qualification for critical access hospitals. Uh, we have a hospital soldiers and sailors in Penyon, New York, in our district, as well as I believe there's nine hospitals uh, in New York State. Uh, that have been impacted by the new mileage calculation, if you would, um, uh, that uh, the um, a HHS has been dealing with and has graciously been put on hold uh, during the pandemic. And I just want to work with you and uh, get recognition from you that um, uh, these critical access hospitals are the backbone of rural hospitals uh, in, in America, especially in districts like ours, and changing that policy uh, from pre-2015 um, determinations to future um, determination is something I'm very sensitive to, and I know many colleagues of mine are very sensitive to, 
And I just wanted to offer, what, what are your thoughts in regards to where we stand on that? And can I get assurance that uh, we do no harm to these critical access hospitals uh, in regards to the reliance on this reimbursement policy? Congressman, uh, I think one thing we found with COVID is that some of our communities that are distant from a provider really need to have the support that makes it possible for all of us to get the care we need. And so here, what I can commit to you is absolutely to work with you on these things. We wanna make sure that we're not making more difficult or more expensive for anyone, especially someone in a rural community, to access the care they need. And so what I will do is, uh, you tell me when you wanna follow up and we will, but because we have monies in this budget that helps us address the needs of rural uh, communities. Make sure, for example, on telehealth, or making sure that those hospitals that were hit really hard by COVID have an opportunity to survive. There's money that was allocated specifically for rural communities. I got eight seconds just on the on the mileage. If we can just go to pre 2015, if you can get that commitment to me today, I would love that right now. But I don't know if you're in a position to do that. I certainly could commit to work with you to see where we can end up. <laughs> you are a pro. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kind, to inquire. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, it's so great to welcome back our friend and former colleague on the committee. Really enjoyed serving with you on the committee. Look forward to partnering with you now in your new capacity. So uh, welcome home, so to speak. Listen, I've, I've been a couple of questions I have. I've been hearing from some of my providers that the provider relief fund money has to be spent by the end of this month, and they're still incurring, incurring some of the pandemic expenses. Is there any consideration of extending that deadline, giving them a little bit more time and in, in, uh, uh, spending the uh, provider relief funds that's been allocated? Carson, I, I feel like I'm in a family reunion, but great to see you. And uh, first uh, to, the, to the question, we're trying to provide some flexibility. We've seen, having watched how the provider relief fund was deployed originally, some of the, the problems that occurred, we're trying to make sure we don't uh, uh, make the mistakes of the past so we're trying to provide some flexibility uh, i can we can follow up with you but we want to make sure everybody keeps the deadlines as best possible we understand the need to have some flexibility so we will soon this month we will be coming out with some guidance to help people make sure that they can apply for and make use of uh, good use of their monies well uh i appreciate that we'll follow up with you on that since uh, we're just a few weeks away away from that deadline also, uh, just so you know, I'm going to be introducing bipartisan legislation again with Mr. Kelly on the committee. It's called the Medicare Advantage Quality Payment Relief Program, and it's the incentive bonus uh, bonus payments for MA plans that are hitting their benchmarks. Unfortunately, uh, the payment levels are based on pre-ACA levels, so it's excluding a lot of quality MA plans. And I don't need an answer from you now. I just want to alert you. We're going to be dropping that bill, and we'll try to work with you to see if we can fix this problem to further incent uh, those uh, relief payments. And as you know, uh, with, with the lead up of the Affordable Care Act, uh, I, you, and others were championing all the uh, paid reform policy proposals that we could get into the legislation. I hope that now the secretary will be able to tap the accelerator a little bit and going to uh, alternative payment uh, methods that emphasize quality, outcome, and value. Uh, I'm reaching out to CMMI with those alternative payment models that are being established. Uh, how committed are you in, in trying to move, continue to move in that direction? All right, and so, um, music to my ears. I think we want to harness innovation everywhere we can. CMMI was a product of the work done on the Affordable Care Act. Well, we, you know, the ARPA-H, is another example of how President Biden really wants to take this to the next level. We'd like to be able to take all that great research and rather than just watch it play out, if we see something that's really exciting, pluck it out and say, wait a minute, we think there's applicability now. The private sector is doing some things, academia. We don't have to keep it just in that uh, NIH uh, stream by itself. We can pluck it out and see if we can accelerate the opportunities to provide that to uh, the public in healthcare. Yeah, because we knew with the ACA, it was more than just extending quality, affordable, accessible health care, but it was also cost containment. And it's something that Ranking Member Brady again raised today, that there's more work to be done on that front. Finally, a uh, big question, though, as we emerge from this global pandemic, is there any thought at HHS of doing a deeper dive on lessons learned coming out of this pandemic? Things we did do well, perhaps more importantly, things we didn't do well that we were caught so flat-footed with all this. 
No doubt. Uh, we, we mentioned telehealth. Clearly, we learned how much we could do with telehealth. We also learned where we've got gaps. Those those communities that are in the corners, in the shadows, and how we still lack the ability to say to every American that we're equitably going to provide you with health care. And so, absolutely, we're going to have a lot of lessons learned from COVID. Right. Thanks, Javier. Great seeing you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. I want to start start by thanking you for being here today to to provide us with your with more insight into the president's budget request. Um, before I jump into the request, I will uh, while I have you here on April 21st, Senator Lee and I sent a letter to the CDC director requesting information on the CDC's mask guidance for children, which I'm sure you know is the most strict in the world. This guidance makes no sense given current, current case numbers, evidence of lower transmission among children, and the negative impact this guidance has on their daily lives. We requested a reply to this letter by May 5th. It is now over a month past the deadline and we have received no response. In light of the summer heat being upon us and reports of some children being forced to wear masks in sweltering temperatures, I think the American people urgently need to know the full picture around how the CDC arrived at its decision that children over two should be masked. Mr. Secretary, will you commit to ensuring the CDC director provides a response to myself and the 31 other members of the House and Senate who signed the letter by the end of this week? Congressman Smith, thank you for the question, and it's an important one. And I commit to you that we'll make sure that any letter that's directed at the, the at the department, including CDC, get, you get a response, and we'll try to make sure we do it as quickly as we can. Uh, and I can go into the issue of, of masks if you like, but I don't know if you want to ask other questions. Yeah, I would like to. I appreciate that. the The main thing is is just to get a response to the thirty one of us. We would definitely appreciate that, and I think that, Mr. Secretary, um, Mr. Secretary, we uh, we still we still do not know for sure whether. COVID originated naturally or as a result of an engineered virus leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Viro Virology. Though it is more likely than not, the latter is true. But we do know that China is actively trying to hinder investigations into the virus's origins. And several prominent scientists who might otherwise be in a position to help us determine the virus origins, like Dr. Fauci, compromised because of conflicts of interest. Can you confirm none of the funds included in this budget would be used to provide aid to foreign laboratories who experiment with deadly or highly contagious contagious pathogens or viruses? Congressman, this is uh, obviously something that everyone's taken interest in. We have to get to the bottom of this when it comes to the origins of COVID-19. The president has asked for uh, an investigation into this within 90 days. He wants to hear a report back. I myself, probably about a month ago, when I had an opportunity to address the world, uh, the World Health Assembly, I also said it was time for us to get to the bottom of this. We all want to make sure we do because addressing pandemics in the future requires us to know the origins of the and of the source. And so I can uh, guarantee you that we'll be looking for partners to work to make sure that we get to the bottom of some of these things. And whether it's the, the authorities within HHS, CDC, NIH, uh, others, or whether it's the president himself and working with the intelligence community to try to get to the bottom of this, we're going to do what we can and we look forward to working with you on that. So, Mr. Secretary, can you tell me um, if there are any funds including in this budget that would be used to aid foreign laboratories who experiment in those deadly contagious pathogens? Is there any dollars in there? Congressman, we have no dollars that are dedicated or earmarked uh, for any foreign sources to do, any, to do anything of the sort. And um, I appreciate it, Mr. Secretary. Um, if, if we do find that China is blamed for this virus, will you commit to holding the Chinese government responsible for this, this catastrophic irresponsibility? Well, I, I've mentioned transparency and accountability is something we're going to seek from anyone and everyone, including HHS. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Secretary. I have serious concerns that Social Security and Supplemental Security income 
benefits that are being paid to foster youth are not getting to them and are not even always being used for their benefit. So Mr. Secretary, will you commit to working with my subcommittee and with uh, Social Security to find a remedy for this serious problem? First, Congressman, may, may I say it's great to see you, and thank you for always championing the cause of so many kids who are underserved, underprivileged, and here, critical. I, I look forward to working with you. We, too, are trying to do a better examination. We want to review uh, the work that's being done by GAO on this particular issue. And as you know, it's complicated because here we have to work with our state and local partners who actually administer some of these programs. But you're absolutely right. We have to make sure that these kids get the kind of care that you and I would expect to give to our kids. And we want to make sure that those kids have some, they have their, their voices included in this as well. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And many of the safety net hospitals in my district, hospitals like Lawrence Children, Loretta, West Suburban, Mount Sinai, Norwegian American, the New Insight are all struggling just to keep their doors over because they serve this population group big time where the money isn't really sufficient. I understand that there are $24 billion unallocated in the provider relief fund. Could you share with us plans for that money or plans to help these institutions that really need it right now? Congressman, as you remember, when I was there in Congress, I worked really hard with you and others to try to make sure that many of these safety net hospitals that care for their our poorest, our sickest, don't go under simply for trying to, for trying to do the right thing. And uh, with the provider relief fund, you would hope that when any dollar is dispensed, it's because that uh, institution, that provider has proven that it deserves to get some support from the taxpayers. We're taking a close look at the provider relief fund with the monies that still remain. We want to make sure that we are transparent in how we do this. And we want to make sure that those providers that seek funding will be accountable for any dollars they receive. But without a doubt, we want to make sure that safety net hospitals that really were there in, in the front line helping some of our sickest Americans uh, during COVID-19 get the support that they, they deserve. And so we'll look forward to working with you to make sure that, as I said, we'll have transparency and accountability in how we disperse those dollars. Thank you so much, and it's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Uh, your testimony that you submitted, your written testimony, didn't mention telehealth. And I've got three very rural counties with majority, minority populations that are very much underserved in terms of health care facilities. Telehealth has been a very big boon to them, particularly in the time of COVID. I'm glad to hear you, your testimony live today where you support telehealth. And I just want to give you one more chance. Do you believe that telehealth provides a valuable resource and particularly for rural and minority areas? Congressman Rice, that's probably the easiest question I've been asked today. The answer is yes. Okay. Yeah, I, hope you're, I hope your further questions will be just the same. Uh, I have a bill up that would require, that, that would allow uh, uh, people to have direct access to audiologists because, again, I've got very uh, rural populations that are very much under, underserved by primary care physicians, and the requirement that they first have to go and get a referral is very onerous to them. I think that this is something that you championed while you were in Congress as well. Will you support uh, a change in the process to allow people to go directly to audiologists rather than being referred under Medicare? Congress, I look forward to working with you. As you mentioned, I worked on a number of these issues. Obviously, I, and now as secretary, my, my job, my role is a little different than as a member of Congress, but absolutely look forward to working with you as you all try to figure out some solutions. Please know that we'll be there for technical assistance or perhaps to be able to implement, uh, but we look forward to working with you. All right. Uh, South Carolina is facing a reduction in their TANF block grant because uh, there's a requirement that you have a 90% paternity establishment to qualify. And uh, 
the reason that we're, we're not able to meet that threshold is because of COVID, because obviously the healthcare facilities and the laboratories were overwhelmed, and we're just now coming out of that. But I don't know how quickly we're going to be able to do it, and we can't really afford to have our welfare recipients uh, be docked because of this, this, back, this, this failure that was put on us by COVID. Would you support a waiver of the 90% paternity establishment requirement? Congressman, I'm going to admit to you that I don't know enough about this to be able to respond, but what I can do is uh, ensure you that I and my team will get back to you and your staff so we can look into this a little bit further. But I appreciate you bringing this up. What I will tell you is the lens from which I look at this is how are we providing accountability and equity and at the same time doing it in a very transparent manner so everyone understands how HHS has, has moved forward. Well, this would, affect, this would affect the poorest of the poor, and it's not their fault. And it's not South Carolina's fault that we had COVID and our facilities were overwhelmed. One last question. I know with interest that your budget uh, includes a 6.5% increase in Medicare spending. Medicare trust fund is slated to go insolvent as soon as 2024. How do you propose to make up the difference in the Medicare trust fund? Do you propose additional payroll taxes? What's your plan? We've got to make this Medicare program promise golden. We've got to make it concrete for our seniors. How can we afford to spend more when we're already going to be insolvent in just three years? Congressman, uh, we're going to do what we can. Uh, I can follow up with you on that, uh, Congressman. I know time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me uh, recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank Secretary Becerra for his testimony today. Before I get to questions, I just want to note how surprising it is that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have mysteriously suddenly become concerned about unaccompanied minors in HHS custody, because these same members didn't seem concerned under the last administration when accompanied children were taken from their parents or where they were forced to stay in squalid camps on the Mexican side of the border because they were prohibited from entering the US. I just find it very interesting that now suddenly there is a concern for their well being. And I wonder why it took so long for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to notice or even care what happens to these children. I'm going to leave my curiosity there, but I couldn't leave that alone without commenting. Um, Secretary Becerra, the president's budget provides long overdue investments to help American families get back on their feet. And the budget includes funding for important democratic priorities that I have proudly supported for many years. Federal help to make health insurance more affordable, access to child and elder care, and many other things. But let's be clear, these investments are, you know, a critical first step as our nation rebuilds and recovers from the pandemic. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed various ways in which our health system isn't really working. And we must follow these investments with actions to address the gaps that we've become aware of. For example, the pandemic show, showed that nursing home facilities were dangerously unprepared to protect the health of residents in their care. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, on average, long-term care facilities account for 5% of COVID cases but over 30% of all COVID deaths in the US. The previous administration advanced many proposals that have allowed nursing homes to steer clear of accountability at the expense of residents and their families. Pre-dispute binding arbitration agreements for, are just one example. And I think that this is tragic. You know, I've been working um, for many years with the American Association for Justice and AARP to try to correct this. Uh, and in, just in April, Congresswoman Schakowsky and I sent a letter discussing the need to rescind a Trump era rule that would end the har harmful use of these uh, binding arbitration agreements. Um, so, Mr. Secretary, uh, Mr. Biden's, I mean, President Biden's budget recognizes the need to provide oversight of nursing homes. Are you considering additional measures to empower nursing residents and their families to exercise their legal rights or to hold nursing? facilities accountable for their actions when they fall short of the standard of care? And will you commit to rescind some of the most damaging Trump policies to better protect our nursing home residents? 
Congresswoman, thank you for your passion on this issue, and we look forward to working with you. Uh, what, one of the areas that I did concentrate quite a bit while I was Attorney General was this area as well, making sure we did better oversight and enforcement. Uh, we intend to do the same thing. Uh, we'll look forward to working with you. Our first obligation in these facilities has to be the patients, and we have to do a better job of being having these facilities be transparent and, and collecting the data that helps us understand what's going on. And so uh, we will look forward to working with you. As I mentioned in my opening testimony, we're going to do everything we can to hold people accountable. And that means that we're going to do uh, a lot of integrity work to make sure that what is out there and what we, we fund with taxpayer dollars has the eyes of the American public on top of it. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And just really quickly, the president's budget includes robust funding for Alzheimer's research, diagnosis, and care. But one of the best ways to sort of set a baseline um, to track this disease early is through the uh, Medicare annual wellness visit. Um, so, you know, I'm curious to know if you what you are doing within HHS and C CMS to strengthen early detection requirements in the annual wellness visit. And I'm run out of time, so I'll take that answer in writing, and I thank you for your presence today. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweiker, to inquire. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, um, first, this is my moment to also um, thank Mr. Thompson for his sort of dogged focus on telehealth, and it worked. Um, we did something amusing a couple of weeks ago. We looked at um, the previous couple of years uh, memos and those things about telemedicine and how skeptical you know, many of our staff and brothers and sisters were now that we've lived through it and we've realized what a plus it was. Uh, I desperately hope you'll um, join us in getting it so it's extended. It just doesn't come to an end, the expansion once the pandemic is declared over. Um, and Mr. Secretary, um, one other thing, uh, and this is sort of the big picture, um, both in reading your budget over the weekend, but just even our own conversation we're having today, many of us talk about healthcare and affordability in a light of who gets subsidized, who does not get subsidized, instead of what we pay. Um, and I will beg of you, start thinking about what we pay, because over the next 30 years, the hundred plus trillion dollars of U.S. sovereign debt that will be on the books in today's dollars, 67% of that is just from Medicare. We need a revolution in what we pay. And something like diabetes is believed to be about 30% of that. I noticed your budget, the president's budget, does have a fairly substantial plus up in spending for diabetes research. I believe you would find many of us on the Republican side are willing to step up and propose almost an operation warp speed to disrupt and finally take on diabetes. Because if you look at health outcomes in rural America, in urban America, and you actually put the charts of bad outcomes from COVID, and you line them up also with the charts from diabetes, you'll find that comorbidity in many ways is responsible for much of the differential in health outcomes. Those are my pitches to you, Mr. Secretary. What do you have to say? Congressman, I think wise words with regard to diabetes and uh, we should heed the call to try to do a better job of addressing some of these chronic illnesses that lead to death so quickly. Uh, and I agree, uh, COVID exposed what we knew about diabetes, that it can kill, and it can kill quickly. Can I just say on, on tel uh, telehealth, uh, absolutely agree that we're going we're gonna to move forward with what we learned from COVID. I would only, I, I don't add two words, uh, access, because you have to have, make sure everyone has access, not just some parts of the, uh, of, the, of the country, not just some rural areas, but you have to make sure that broadband extends everywhere so everyone has access. And the second thing is accountability. As, as we go, let, let folks do provide care uh, further and further from the source, we just wanna make sure it's accountable because taxpayer money, whether through Medicare or Medicaid is in there, we have to make sure we're getting the value for our dollar. Mr. Secretary, I may I encourage you and your staff to look at one or two things. One, every inch of North America now has broadband. 
It's called low earth satellites. For being from Arizona, as you would know, being from the West, you know, my rural, my Native American populations in the middle of nowhere where it would be irrational to run a line of fiber or copper. Now with a small satellite dish, they have broadband. We need to start thinking in terms of this century. The second thing is the ability to audit and monitor telehealth. And telehealth is more than FaceTime with a doctor. Telehealth is also the sensors I can wear on my body that monitor and help us keep healthy. I believe we could crash the cost of healthcare if we're willing to be disruptive technology. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary, thank you for being here. Um, I just want to uh, recognize how far we've come in the past 15 months. Last year at this time, the United States was the world leader in COVID-19 deaths. Um, today, we're the world leader in vaccination distribution and administration. 42% of Americans are fully vaccinated. That is an incredible incredible uh, accomplishment over a very short period of time. The science for these vaccines came from scientists within the National Institutes of Health and in BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, Mr. Secretary, that comes under your uh, jurisdiction. Again, an incredible, an incredible accomplishment. The messenger RNA is the stuff that converts DNA to proteins. Proteins are the active ingredient in the vaccines. Moderna stock is up 10% today, one of the manufacturers of the vaccine. Uh, Moderna's pre-COVID share price was $21 a share. Today it's $209 a share. Uh, Moderna uh, pre-COVID was valued at about $6 billion. Today, they're valued at $32 billion and projected to be a $100 billion company within the next 48 months. There is a 1980s law uh, that keeps the government from sharing in the commercial success of the taxpayer-funded research that made these vaccines possible. And my question is, you know, given the United States government's investment of $11.5 billion into vaccine development and all of the years of research that predated the actual manufacturing of them, don't you think it's time that the U.S. taxpayer share in some way beyond the public good that it does, but share in the financial success that would not have been possible without the research, which is very expensive and not profitable, uh, financed by the American taxpayers. Congressman, first, good to see you. Always good to see you. Uh, secondly, you ask a really telling question. Uh, and it's not one that I think in less than five minutes or in, even in a hearing we'll be able to answer. But it is true that taxpayers made major investments to make it possible for all of us, including people around the world, to have a life-saving vaccine. And I, I think one, it speaks to the innovation and the, the prowess of America. Two, it also speaks to our generosity. But three, it also speaks to where we need to go, you as policymaker, me as ex, ex, uh, executor now of the policy, uh, to make sure that we're ready for the next pandemic. We're ready to provide the next uh, generation of medicines. I, I am more than willing to engage that conversation because we're gonna count on our taxpayers to help make this work. And at the same time, our taxpayers expect us to be accountable so that they know that it's worth an investment. They have the confidence to continue to pay their taxes to make the kinds of investments that have made America so strong. So I look forward to having that conversation, but you, you pose a, a really important uh, question. And just finally, uh, Mr. Secretary, um, I represent communities along the US Canadian border and we need to get more vaccines into Canada. Uh, so that we can get that U.S. Canadian border open. This doesn't require a comment from you, but I just want to make very clear: every opportunity I get to talk to somebody from the administration, I have to convey that message. So, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And I just add that I just recently had conversations with Health Minister Hadou on some of these subjects from Health Minister from Canada. So we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman. To uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Becerra, for joining us today. Right now, I'm very concerned with President Biden's border crisis and the surge of unaccompanied minors that we've heard about today, unaccompanied migrant children, and it has overwhelmed the Border Patrol and other federal agencies. The current humanitarian crisis at our southern border could have been avoided if the Biden administration hadn't undone years of work of the Trump administration to establish robust enforcement mechanisms, close regulatory loopholes, secure uh, agreements with Mexico and Central American countries, and constructed vital security infrastructure like the border wall. The previous administration's approach was an innovative and well-coordinated effort between federal and foreign agencies and foreign governments. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record an article from the National Review entitled, How Trump Got Control of the Border. In contrast, the current administration has rejected these common sense policies, which were clearly working. Not surprisingly, the result is a crisis that far surpasses anything we ever saw under President Obama and Trump. The Biden administration has a responsibility to acknowledge that what we are seeing at the southern border is indeed a crisis and that its misguided policies are to blame. The Biden administration also has a duty to address the downstream effects of the current border crisis. We've seen local news reports from Washington and Texas about foster youth being displaced and forced to, to vacate their residence in order to make room for unaccompanied migrant children. This is extremely alarming, especially given the already limited available of more permanent placements for foster children. Mr. Secretary, what's the extent to which the surge of unaccompanied minors at the border has impacted or burdened the capacity of state child welfare agencies to place foster children? And then as a follow-up, has any child in foster care at a not-for-profit or community-based organization been displaced by HHS contracts to house on a couple of minors? Congresswoman, thank you for the question. And let me, as I uh, said to Congressman Brady, assure you that we, are, we take every step necessary at HHS to make sure that the work we do with the unaccompanied migrant children does not impact the ability of the domestic foster care system to care for our children who need that foster care service. And we have done uh, a tremendous amount of work to try to make sure that at the same time at the border, we are relieving the Customs and Border uh, Protection Service from the, uh, the need to try to care in what are essentially adult detention facilities uh, for children. And so we've been able to uh, place those kids into our custody and keep them safe and healthy the way the law requires us to. Thanks. And Mr. Secretary, would you agree that it's important for HHS and the FDA to require rigorous reporting on drugs developed specifically for women so we can clearly understand potential risks or complications to women? We certainly want to make sure that we follow the science. And I think FDA tries to do that as best it can. And we are always going to try to make sure that we put out the type of medicine that we have has been proven to be safe and effective. And that includes whether it's for women or for men, we wanna make sure that what we can do is make sure that Americans can trust our healthcare system. Thanks, and I think we should prioritize better data collection on the chemical abortion pill, Prifamestone then. In addition to killing an unborn child, this drug can cause heavy bleeding and serious infections in women. And yet, as of 2016, providers of Mifeprestone are only required to report patient deaths, but not to report hospitalization transfusion or any other serious events will you commit to prioritizing better data collection for this drug so we'll have a clear picture of the potential risks it poses to women and, and congresswoman as you, as you know when the fda acts when uh, hhs takes action on uh, prescription medication we follow the science and certainly we'll make sure that uh, everyone is accountable because we have to ensure that the public has confidence in the system thank the gentle lady let me recognize thank the gentle lady for let me recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to thank you and Secretary Becerra. Welcome him back to this committee. As a, um, a longtime member of this committee, Secretary Becerra, it's great to see you. I am encouraged that uh, President Biden's budget invests in health care and the economy and aims to improve the health of all Americans, especially by addressing the needs of seniors and people with disabilities and expanding access to the ACA, healthcare, tax credits, and Medicare benefits. 
However, the pandemic has laid bare the historic racial inequities that exist in our healthcare system for so many Americans. My constituency in the Black Belt of Alabama is painfully aware of the pervasive, pervasive systemic and institutional influence that have influenced and contributed to the disparities in healthcare. As is, is true in so many areas of healthcare, a lot of the problems center around access to care and trust in the medical and scientific community. A specific area that I'd like to focus on today is cancer, a disease that takes over 600,000 American lives every year, and one that minority and rural populations are especially burdened by due to the higher rates of late stage diagnosis. Experts tell us that one of the most important ways to beat cancer is to catch it early before it spreads. If you or your loved one is diagnosed with cancer, the very next word that you want to hear is, but we've caught it early enough. I have sponsored last Congress and this Congress, a bipartisan bill called the Medicare Multiple Cancer Early Detection Screening Coverage Act, a bill that I am pleased to be co-sponsoring with colleagues, um, Representative Arrington, Ruiz, and Hudson. This legislation seeks to modernize Medicare coverage to enable providers and seniors to have access to new tests that use a simple blood draw to screen for over 50 types of cancer, including pancreatic cancer, and find them early when patients still have a fighting chance. But until now, our tools to do so have been limited, Secretary Becerra. We only have screening for five cancers that are covered by Medicare. And for this reason, pancreatic cancer and so many other cancers are not being found early enough and the impact on seniors and Medicare in terms of cost is staggering. Catching cancer at its earliest stage in people without symptoms would be an amazing game changer. Currently, unknown cancers continue to spread, often becoming um, metastatic, and lives are lost because of that. For example, pancreatic cancer, which is the third leading cause of cancer in my home state of Alabama, has a very low survival rate in part because it is not caught early enough. Only 80% of the cases present that present with this disease have a survival rate. Only 15% of pancreatic cancers are found early enough and survival rates for pancreatic cancer are six times higher when it is found earlier versus late. In fact, this very committee, your colleague, our friend, Congressman John Lewis passed away because of this cancer. Fortunately, a new multi-cancer early detection screening tools are emerging for our seniors and, and Medicare patients who are often most at risk. I ask for your commitment, Secretary Becerra, in addressing this horrible cancer, all of these cancers, by expanding the access to tools in the toolkit that will be paid for by Medicare that we can catch this disease early on. Um, in closing, I'd like to ask a question regarding that, sir. I know that you're committed to closing the equity gaps that exist in healthcare. Can you talk to us specifically about what your um, this administration is doing about that and what, how we can work with you in order to make sure we're saving lives? Mr. Chairman, why don't I respond back to Congresswoman Sewell? Uh, I'm gonna give a brief Congresswoman response, Mr. Secretary, that'd be fine. Absolutely, then uh, very briefly, and we can always follow up Congresswoman. Uh, first, preventative care, that was the whole process behind the Affordable Care Act is to get to people before they were too sick. And we know for many communities, especially rural and uh, racial communities, we're always at the end of the end of the stage when it comes to getting that kind of care up front. Secondly, data. We need to get good data. And third, learn from the lessons of COVID that we got to do a better job of reaching those corners of America that are left behind. But we can follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentle lady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Dr. Winstrup to inquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Well, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, pleasure to be with you today. Uh, you know, healthcare, I'm a physician. Healthcare is and should be a national priority. I'm encouraged to hear you talk about finding the origins of COVID, identifying that. I served on our Board of Health in Cincinnati, and you're exactly right. We can't address these types of issues if we don't get to the bottom. Um, going to the border quickly, I when I visited there back in April, we saw Many coming in with lice, scabies, meningitis, chickenpox, flu, and of course, COVID-19. 
And uh, I think that this is a very serious concern that we have for the health of America when this is coming in. So I do want to work with you. I'm con encouraged by your concern, uh, but let's let's work towards a, a healthy a legal immigration policy that uh, is best for everyone. Want to go to next to drug pricing, and we you know we need to address the the cost of drugs in the United States. It's important for our patients, and I think there's uh, bipartisan room here. And I believe that uh, foreign price controls will not leave room for the next set of cures. And so we have that balance between innovation and and then cost. At the end of the day, let's lead the let's lead the world on on both of those things. Um, I know there's a lot of things we can work together on. I always talk about the health span of America. You just kind of touched on it there a little bit. Uh, it, we 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 always take a look at lifespan, but what about the health span of Americans? Prevention and cures are often looked at as a cost, and that's on the short term. But we don't often look at what we save in the long term when we do this. And it sounds like you're on board with that. I do want you to be aware that we have a rural and underserved healthcare task force that the chairman uh, put together. And it includes Representative Arrington, Sewell, Davis, and, and me. And I look forward to working with you to address the health disparities in these communities. Uh, and you sound eager to want to engage in those. So I appreciate that. Uh, substance abuse, we can't uh, ignore that. It's a problem. If you've read the book Dreamland, uh, that's my district on the cover. If you haven't read it, I recommend it uh, to your attention. I'm proud of the work we've done on surprise billing. Let's make sure it gets gets done right. And I will say this to it as a physician, oh. there's no part of me that doesn't oh. want Americans to have access to, to health care. Uh, that's ob obviously extremely important. You know, we talk about Medicaid. I'm proud to live in a country that has a safety net like that, that is there for people so that we can maintain some health for those that have trouble affording it and for other reasons. But the statistics have showed that that particular plan has the highest mortality and morbidity of any in the country. And, you know, I think we're better if we start to look at solutions to how fewer Americans need the Medicaid program, because the fewer that are on it, then the better it is for those that are still in it. That's more of that. We want more of the best care for more Americans. So I'd like to continue to work with you on those issues. So I threw out a lot there, but I really do look forward to working with you. And, I, and I'm asking you one question. Will you commit to work with Congress and in particularly members of Congress that uh, have medical backgrounds? Uh, we met many times, our doctor's caucus, we met many times with Secretary Azar and it was very productive and I think we could probably do the same with you. And so I'm hoping that as you work through payment rules and other issues that impact our healthcare providers and more so our patients that uh, you'd be able to spend some time with us as we've uh, had boots on the ground, so to speak. Congressman, you put a lot out there, but I certainly am looking forward to working with you and uh, uh, working with you from the vantage point of a, a physician, your experiences, uh, are going to be immensely important and helpful to us. So absolutely look forward to working with you and your colleagues. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank the gentleman. Uh, consistent with committee practice, we will now move to a two to one questioning ratio, beginning with the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Del Bene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, for being with us. It's great to see you. Um, and um, thank you for the work that you and your staff have been doing already on so many important issues and for preparing uh, this very forward-looking budget proposal. Um, I'm particularly pleased by the inclusion of Kidney X. Um, Kidney X is a public-private partnership that was established to accelerate innovation in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of kidney diseases. More than 37 million Americans are living with kidney diseases and nearly 800,000 suffer from kidney failure, which is an incurable disease which requires dialysis every few days to stay alive, and it's only cured by a kidney transplant. Um, kidney disease can be extremely debilitating, causing patients to leave the workforce or die prematurely, and the cost to Medicare is substantial. Nearly a quarter of all traditional Medicare spending is on kidney disease management. But sadly, kidney disease disproportionately affects communities of color. Black Americans comprise 13% of the US population, but represent 33% of Americans living on dialysis, which is just one striking example of the health disparities in our country. 
And since roughly half of all patients who were hospitalized from COVID-19 suffered kidney damage, we can expect these figures to worsen. Um, when Kidney X was conceived, there was an expectation of $125 million from the private sector and $125 million from the federal government. And given the remarkable success of this public-private partnership in its first two years, running for prize competitions in which winning innovators in 44 congressional districts tackled long unmet kidney patient needs and made inroads to an artificial kidney, um, what kind of increased commitment can we expect from the administration in the coming years? Um, the private sector, which has been led by the American Society of Nephrology, has already committed matching funds of 25 million annually to kidney X. And I hope we can count on you and um, the administration to help match that commitment. Congresswoman, great to see you. And I know in our budget, we do include some uh, funding for the Kidney Inno Innovation Accelerator. Uh, I don't have the amount, we can try to get that to you later, but we do make a commitment uh, to continue Kidney X because you just mentioned the reasons. Uh, it's, it's so important that we try to address these these types of conditions as quickly and early as possible. And as you mentioned, oftentimes uh, this disproportionately impacts communities of color. And so look for, very much look forward to, to working with you on this. When I have a chance to visit your great state, maybe run into your husband, Kurt, again, as I did the other day, uh, we'll have opportunities to discuss any number of these issues. Thank you. Um, also, um, Everyone uh, knows that we have so many areas of healthcare policy where there are opportunities to do better. And one key area is prior authorization in Medicare Advantage. Um, I've partnered with Congressman Kelly. Um, we have garnered overwhelming bipartisan support to make prior authorization fully electronic and streamlined. Um, patients need care right away. This is critically important that we have a system that works and um, also look forward to working with you to help us improve prior authorization for our providers and our seniors who right now face unnecessary delays in care. So look forward to working with you on that as well. Absolutely look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, to inquire. Secretary Becerra, it's so wonderful to have you back with the committee today and always a pleasure to see a fellow Southern Californian. As California's Attorney General, you led an amicus brief to defend the human rights of children in immigration detention as established by the Flores Settlement Agreement. After visiting one of these unlicensed facilities in 2019 put together under the last administration, I was horrified and introduced the Shutdown Child Prison Camps Act to ensure no federal money would be allocated to emergency influx shelters that don't comply with Flora's standards, which prevent children from being held in inhumane conditions. How will you ensure all policies related to the care and custody of unaccompanied minors are compliant with these standards and that these standards are the minimum to which children will be treated by your department? Congressman, thank you for your work on this. Great to see you and uh, to continue to work with you now in this position. And I, I think if you've had a chance to visit some of the sites that we have stood up, you'll see that uh, not only do we care about following the law, but we, we treat these kids as what they are, children. And we're going to provide them with the health and safety that is expected. Uh, it is not easy. It is a challenge. It is not inexpensive, but we believe we have an obligation to do it right. You know, there are a couple of sites there local to you uh, in Long Beach and in Pomona. And uh, if you have a chance to see those sites, you'll, you'll see something very, very interesting. In Long Beach, we were told, this was about a month ago when I was there, some 70,000 uh, toys and gifts had been donated by folks in the community in Southern California for these kids. Obviously, we don't have 70,000 kids in the Long Beach site. That made it possible for us to be able to send some of those toys and new toys, new books to other children throughout the country where we have these sites. And so I think we look at this very, very importantly as something that we need to do because these are kids. Thank you. And I did visit the Pomona site and it was very, very impressive and so different uh, in, from the last administrations. Secretary Becerra, thank you. And President Biden for offering a budget without the harmful and discriminatory Hyde Amendment. I also wanna thank you for highlighting the importance of the Title X Family Planning Program in your testimony. 
Um, after years of President Trump's harmful domestic gag rule, I believe we have to swiftly implement the new Biden administration rule once finalized to bring providers back into the program and provide quality family planning care to their patients. So can you discuss how you plan to rebuild this program as soon as possible, including by administering the additional funding that Congress provided Title X providers in the American Rescue Plan? How can we in Congress be helpful to you in this effort to ensure that more low-income Americans have access to this vital and successful program? Congressman, uh, Congresswoman, as you know, uh, Title X is one of the crucial programs to make sure that we provide access to care to many families that otherwise would go without it. And so we intend to try to move as quickly as we can to provide access to family planning services, which by the way, are not just services for women. Uh, men, uh, children uh, receive services through the Title X funding that's provided at the federal level. In California, as you know, uh, we rely on a lot of our uh, uh, third parties to help make those programs work. And what we're going to do is work as closely as we can to make sure that, according to the law, we're providing services under Title X to anyone who needs those family planning uh, services up front. Thank you. And let me just say a word for um, disaggregation of data for Asian Pacific Islanders. At the beginning of the pandemic, AAPIs were lumped into the other category on the CDC website, uh, and that prevented us from knowing very crucial information. So I just urge you to continue to disaggregate data. I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your appearance here today. Um, I, I, uh, I do want to kind of reflect on how, uh, you know, the CARES Act came about at the beginning of the pandemic done on a very bipartisan basis and operation warp speed was done uh, on a bipartisan basis and you know I'll, I'll be very direct with you and tell you i'm, I'm concerned that things are being done uh, without uh, a spirit of, of negotiation uh, and compromise uh, more specifically um, i, I want to talk about the, the cmmi center for medicare and medicaid innovation and my underlying concern is that providers and patients uh, aren't able to give the feedback or for feedback to be received. Perhaps it can be given. I'm, I'm not sure uh, it is, is being re uh, as received as, as I think it can and should be. Uh, we've worked on a bipartisan basis on, on, on the committee here and, and beyond um, to, to move this forward in a way that that can really move us toward value-based health care uh, that I think is uh, supported uh, on both sides, or shall we say on all sides. Um, the al alternative the payment models, uh, there, there's concern that the election uh, stood in the way there, and, and, and now uh, things are being disregarded, and uh, overall, we're just kind of the, the uh, alternative payment model situation is getting set aside is my fear. And so I was wondering if you had uh, an update on that, uh, perhaps CMMI in general, even uh, of uh, where you think we are headed there and where we might be able to work together. Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, CMMI, Quite honestly, I think CMMI is at the cutting edge and lets us know how to deal with healthcare moving forward, not only in terms of better health, but better costs when it comes to healthcare. So uh, if there are some questions or any comments or concerns that folks want to raise, I hope they will because CMI is a small shop, but it does really important work. And I hope what we can say is that we're proceeding uh, on a bipartisan basis when it comes to the work of innovation because no one has the corners of market when it comes to innovation. We, we, there are a whole bunch of innovators out there that could care less what our politics are. They just want to get something out there in practice. And so I look forward to working with you on that. Uh, I think uh, President Biden has made it very clear. In fact, as his, he's talking about negotiating on the Americans job, American jobs and American family plans, he's, he's trying to see where we can work something out to move forward with infrastructure investments and in sort. But I look forward to working with you and and all of your colleagues on both sides of the aisle, especially on something like CMMI, because I think we'll both, we can both agree that CMMI is one of those incubators of good ideas. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Um, on another brief topic here, telehealth. You know, we, we have some telehealth measures that are due to expire uh, at the end of the pandemic. Um, I was wondering if you could touch briefly or, or just to acknowledge uh, perhaps a desire to, to utilize telehealth more or at least continue what we have uh, been able to achieve uh, throughout the pandemic. I mean, this is an issue that I worked on even before the, the pandemic, have, you know, representing a very rural constituency. And obviously, we have reasons more than rural now uh, to to utilize telehealth. Uh, so I, I was wondering if you could reflect briefly on on telehealth. You might want to unmute, I think. Looks like you're muted. On, on my, uh, so, Secretary, it looks like you're muted. There we go. There we go. Uh, yeah. Briefly, yeah. Secretary, on telehealth. Okay, here. Here we go. I apologize. Actually, as a Christian, telehealth is critical. And we will do everything we can to try to implement some of the things that we learned as a result of, of COVID. Are you getting the echo that I'm receiving? I, I do hear some feedback, but I think you're better. Go ahead. Well, we look forward to working with you on that because that's crucial. Telehealth has proven itself a true value. Uh, we just have to make sure that we can provide it equitably and that we have accountability in its use so that we can uh, assure the American public that the money is being well used. You bet, you bet. Thank you very much, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, let me recognize the general lady from uh, Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, to inquire. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, all of my fellow uh, colleagues on the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, Mr. Secretary, I predicted that you'd be back here. You just can't lay in the sun and on the beach forever. Um, and at a time like this, you are really, really needed. Welcome back uh, to Washington. Uh, so many questions, so little time. Um, let me just say that I gave up years of seniority to get on this committee, primarily to deal with uh, the, the problem of a permanent underclass that we've created, uh, comprising mostly women uh, who are under the TANF program. And the minute they earn two cents over the minimum wage, they, they lose child care, they lose help, they are the primary uh, employees uh, in a low wage economy of restaurant workers, $2.18 an hour, healthcare workers, uh, CNAs, and so on. Um, and so you have committed a billion dollars toward uh, an emergency uh, relief for this uh, group of folk, and then another $100 million to make sure that uh, people of color are not overrepresented in welfare programs. So number one, I am curious about how that money is being spent. And secondly, I'm curious about what have you we learned in terms of time limits, in terms of requiring people, you know, time limits in a, in a uh, you know, counter cyclical economy uh, and um, um, that we might inform us as we um, reauthorize or end welfare as we know it. And then um, sort of a going out of the door question, where is the beef? Um, I, um, um, I am so happy to see that the administration has committed $400 million to the problems of maternal uh, uh, morbidity and ma maternal uh, uh, fatalities. Um, and, um, but I am wondering, um, it, I'm hoping to work with you to make sure that there's some meat on these bones. I have a proposal uh, we know we have the momnibus, but I also have a proposal, Mamas First, to make sure that Medicaid pays for doulas and midwives and people who are really uh, expanding the healthcare workforce to prevent some of these deaths. Also, signed into law under the former administration is a scarlet sunshine on sudden unexpected death. N you know, leading cause of infant deaths 
Um, but uh, we need to know. I'm work. I want to work with you to make sure we actually fund it now that it's law. It would it would provide it would research and best practices on how to prevent the so-called SIDS deaths. And so I will yield to you for your response, Mr. Secretary. Congresswoman, great to be with you. I will say to you two things. One, we need to help those who are in most need. And whether it's the fund that was made available to, to, for those TANF recipients, uh, we're going to try to do the best we can to make sure that they recover from COVID as best possible. We look forward to working with you because most of those funds still have to be drawn down. Uh, on the second issue, on maternal mortality and morbidity, you know this well. It is communities of color that suffer the most, including in the black community where you see this really impacting so many women. Uh, we have done what we can to try to make it clear states should sign on to help us. One of the things that we've done is provided through the through Medicaid, a program that allows women to receive postpartum care more for more than just 60 days, but for a full year. And so we hope that they'll take advantage of that. I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. It's uh, always good to see you. I never had the chance to serve with you on this committee, uh, but we serve together and I'm happy to see my friend. Uh, also, I'm, I'm really pleased to see the new HHS initiative, the Low Income Housing Water Assistance Program, which will make funding available to help low-income families afford something as simple as their water bill. Uh, as you know, I've been advocating for a program like this for many years. You uh, were right there with me fighting for the people of my hometown uh, when it was in a water crisis. Access to clean drinking water is fundamentally uh, a basic human right. Uh, some of the poorest communities in America pay the highest water rates. For example, uh, just a few years ago, it was found that on average, uh, residents in my hometown of Flint paid almost $900 a year for water service, many paying more than $1,000 a year, many several hundred dollars a month. A lot of communities facing systemic issues, job loss, population loss, failing infrastructure, have had to increase water rates, shifting the burden again to some of the poorest ratepayers uh, in the country. And so I commend the HHS uh, for moving forward on this important effort. And I'm just curious if you can share with us, either now or uh, in writing, what HHS is doing to that, that funding will be made available as soon as possible to places like Saginaw Bay City, but also other places around the country where this is a really serious issue. Congressman, great first to see you and um, waiting for you to take that seat behind you uh, in front of those drums, uh, <laughs> maybe later. Uh, what I will tell you is that we have, I believe the, the initial round of funding has gone out, I think last week, about $160 million. There's over a billion dollars that would be made available, but without a doubt, the sooner we can get this out, more people, we're, more families we're going to help and save. And so thank you for the work that you've always been so actively behind. And uh, we look forward to partnering with you on this. I appreciate that very much. I mean, we know, especially during the, the pandemic, when people were being continually reminded to wash their hands, and very often those poorest people were having to make a decision about whether they're going to turn that tap on, knowing that the bill is just going to run. We have a real uh, problem in this country where we have uh, real disparate uh, cost structures for something as fundamental as drinking water. So this program, I think, really has an opportunity to help correct some of that. It won't be until we make the big infrastructure investments that allow some of those places that are structurally unsound, have water systems that are structurally unsound, uh, to correct some of those deficiencies and have a water delivery system that is uh, more affordable long term. But in the meantime, this program is really uh, an important intervention and I appreciate your work on it. Uh, and so with that, I say thank you. It's good to see you. Hope to see you in person sometime soon. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Congrats on your appointment and um, thank you for your service to our country. 
Uh, I will look uh, high and low for common ground and uh, always think it's best when we can work together in a bipartisan fashion. I'm, I'm honored that the chairman and ranking member had entrusted me to serve on the health care, rural health care task force for ways and means. We've done a lot of good work on payment system reform and a telehealth application to improve access in rural communities. And there's much more to do, and I look forward to working with you on that uh, uh, specifically. Um, we all have uh, desired goals that I think we agree upon with respect to health care policies and getting these incentives right. Uh, namely to improve access and quality and to lower the cost. I would say that uh, Obamacare was an abject failure on all of the, on, on every front in that regard. I mean, it doubled the cost of care. People literally millions paid a fine to get out of the program and the ones that stayed in it had very little choice. And so I think doubling down on the experiment in government controlled health care is a real a disaster exponential. And uh, I, I do think it also expanding or, 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 or making permanent the temporary waivers um, it is a problem, especially when you, you take away the, the, the uh, percentage of poverty level and below whereby people receive subsidized care. So now people making millions can get subsidized care. I, I think that's wrongheaded and irresponsible. Um, I think that the mention of climate crisis is always intriguing to me. Um, I think we all just, I have a different opinion and, and definition of crisis. Uh, I do believe in stewarding the environment for sure. Um, but I think if you ask seniors, for example, if they thought the climate change was their crisis or in five years, Medicare being insolvent was a crisis, I'd say they, the latter scares uh, them a whole lot more. And I see no plan to to fix it, I, I, I see only a, an acceleration of the insolvency by expanding Medicare to 60 to 65. Now, on the topic of crisis, I know I haven't heard a lot of admission that there's a crisis at the border in the administration. And I'm not trying to play get, you know, a, a, a gotcha here, but if you go to the Texas border, um, you will find out that there is just absolute chaos and there are threats to Americans on many fronts not the least of which is the spread of COVID coming across the border. This administration kept Title 42, for which I'm grateful, but it only partially implements it. That is, it, it differentiates between a single adult and a child and, or somebody that's part of a family. They're all hosts. They all are, create a threat of bringing COVID, spreading it, inundating our system, and having a surge that could uh, not only put us in a bad way, but could actually kill American people. So, Mr. Secretary, would you address Title 42 and why that differentiation and why not just fully enforce it during this uh, pandemic and recovery? And I yield all the rest of the time to you. And I thank you again for your service to our country. Congressman, thank you for the question. What I can tell you is that Title 42 is based on the actions by CDC based on the science. And so the administration moves on Title 42 based on the recommendations made by CDC. The implementation then impacts not just HHS, but Department of Homeland Security and others as well. What I can say to you is that uh, we use the best judgment we can based on the science to take action. And I can try to respond further in the future. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Thank the gentleman. For, let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, to inquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's great to see you again, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, seven years ago, when I first won, literally the very first call that I received from a future colleague was from Javier Becerra. So you've been a, a good friend to me and my family uh, ever since. Uh, in, in just a few minutes available, I wanted to try to quickly highlight two areas the first is just a statement. I was very excited to see in this budget a commitment to expanding Medicare in uh, dental, vision, and hearing. In my view and the view of many of, of my House colleagues, that is a real uh, missing gap in our current Medicare system. So one of the many things I'm excited about with this budget proposal is the commitment to expansion there, building upon the work that many of us have, have done on this side of the aisle. 
Um, but let me shift gears to, to something different and, and try to, I know you've talked about it already, but try to get uh, further comments uh, on. I am very alarmed about the uh, dramatic spike we've seen in mental health issues and substance abuse over the last year and few months. Um, governments, uh, the 50 state governments and various municipalities uh, and the federal government had to take dramatic action to try to best fight the pandemic. Even despite those efforts, this is the third deadliest event in American history. Um, but the, one of the many downsides of, of the actions that we had to take is the spike that we've seen, for example, a 30% year over year increase in substance abuse deaths, overdose deaths, not to mention the dramatic rise in mental health issues. I've seen it in my own community and among people I know. So I was wondering what, you know, not just for this budget, but if you were to take a step back, what you think we could do together to attempt to address these two twin but related crises? Congressman, good to see you first. But secondly, uh, I hope that we can work together on this on a bipartisan basis. I, I will say to you that we begun. A week or so ago, I announced that we were releasing $3 billion to help local governments, states, and our community partners address both mental health and substance use disorders in our communities. And we hope that we can supplement that with your help through the American Family uh, Plan to make sure that we take this on. We really do need to get to the point where we treat, we treat mental health the same way we treat physical health in terms of insurance and, and coverage. So I'm looking forward to working with you on this because it's time and COVID-19 has exposed the, the deficiencies we have in our system. Yeah, that, that just building off what you said very quickly, Mr. Secretary, um, COVID-19 didn't create these problems, but boy, it has helped expose what already existed and then exacerbated those issues. Uh, unfortunately, some of our friends um, uh, out there in, in the private industry as much as we attempt to pass legislation mandating parity, we still see time and again where in practice it is just not being carried out the same way. Finally, I would say one of the bright spots, one of the few bright spots out of the 2016 presidential election was a, a real, for the first time in my lifetime, focus on the opioid addiction and overdose issue. Um, I would point out to everyone, overdoses were worse last year than even back four or five years ago when it was getting a lot more attention. So this is something that requires us again to focus on on a bipartisan basis and to solve. So with that, I, I say thank you and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer, to inquire. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And Mr. Secretary, it's so good to see that alums of the Ways and Means Committee can turn out okay. So I'm, I'm encouraged for all of us. And uh, Mr. Secretary, while I was pleased to see the president's budget line for the suicide lifeline and the CDC climate program, I am concerned about the underfunding of the Agency for Health Research and Quality, or for a president that wants to look at health inequities, the agency is this rare entity that actually looks at our healthcare system and tries to address the geographic and the racial and the ethnic disparities. So, Thanks for paying attention to that in the days to come. Mr. Secretary, as you know, the airlines have been pushing for digital health passes that can store vaccine certificates and the results of COVID-19 and antibody tests. And they say this will make it a lot easier to track the veracity of documents, avoid the need to check them physically at airports. Uh, and not only that, the businesses would like to see digital health passes for their reopening. And starting opening, opening the EU gateway for the EU digital COVID certificates up and running. Um, the system allows to ver verify certificates in a secure and privacy friendly way. Will the U.S. be joining this effort, Mr. Secretary? Congressman Byer, great to see you. Uh, what I can mention to you is that uh, I just came back from a meeting of the G7 health ministers. This was one of the subjects that was discussed. Uh, I think what we have done is uh, explain to our colleagues uh, in Europe and Asia and uh, Africa and Latin America and throughout <laughs> that what we intend to do is make sure that our citizens will be able to meet whatever tests the for authentication verification 
that the uh, country uh, is, is asking for, a region might be asking for. Although I think here in this country, we've taken the approach that working with our private sector, we will try to make sure that uh, we leave it to our local communities to decide what will, what will be done to try to ensure the safety of all Americans as we move forward. And so we believe that we'll have a solution that speaks to the acceptance of a method of verifying that will be uh, useful for any American who wishes to travel to another, to another country and for those wishing to come into the U.S. Great. Thank you. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, Ireland sent a pamphlet to all its citizens explaining COVID with, with the stoplight system, you know, the red, yellow, green, uh, the kinds of colored rank risk that we use for air pollution or forest fires. And But I'm amazed that, you know, most Americans were looking at Bloomberg or the New York Times or the COVID tracking project um, for data rather than the CDC. And now there's this great site called COVID Act Now. I was just on it this morning. It's very intuitive and very accessible. Even in Virginia, I can see that if I'm in Alexandria, my risk is very low. If I'm in Carroll County, I'm in deep trouble right now. Uh, it'd be a great thing for the CDC to model so that we're turning not necessarily to a, a nonprofit, but to the CDC to get that kind of data. And I recommend this COVID Act Now website for your information. Our Congressman, we'll take a look and we'll look forward to working with you on these subjects. And then one small pushback in the time left. I, I know my, my friend, Mr. Arrington, talked about Title 42, but I know that President Trump did invoke that over the objections of senior scientists at the CDC who argued that the ban lacked and still lacks any medical or scientific justification. So I'd be I just ask that you use all due diligence to make sure that it is still appropriate and was not inappropriate to revoke Title 42. All right, so that is your back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Ferguson, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, thank you, Mr. Secretary, Secretary, for being with us today. Um, you know, you've said several times that you are very supportive of the administration's budget. Um, and but one of one of the areas I want to talk about briefly is HR three. I'm very concerned about the the impact that, that will have on innovation. I'm very concerned about the um, you know the impact that that's going to have on bringing uh, cures for Alzheimer's, diabetes, other things like that to uh, you know to the American people. But I'm also concerned about the loss of manu pharmaceutical manufacturing jobs. Could you briefly tell me which um, pharmaceutical manufacturing jobs you're willing to eliminate and send to China? Congressman, thank you for the question. And I think we're actually going to see the number of jobs in this country increase as a result of some of the proposals that the president has. And uh, if you take a look at the pharmaceutical... Uh, but, but, but Mr. Secretary, if, if, if you don't mind, I'm talking about specifically pharmaceutical manufacturing jobs. Do you see that with, with the lack of investment and in innovation and, and the impacts of HR3, we're going to lose those jobs? Which jobs are you willing to sacrifice and send to China? Congressman, as I was saying, we, we're in the, in the business of increasing the number of jobs, including the pharmaceutical industry. And I, in fact, some of the monies that were made available through the American Rescue Plan will make it possible for us to make that domestic commitment for manufacturing in the U.S. We look forward to working with you because we want any good. So, 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 Mr. Secretary, am I am I hearing you correctly that you, if 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 a piece of legislation would decrease manufacturing jobs in the U.S., you would be opposed to that? We are looking for ways to increase the number of good, jobs. Good, thank you. Next, um, I know that we've touched on this briefly. You've uh, You've talked about the increase in funding for Title uh, Title Ten, um, particularly around family planning. Between the increase in funding for Planned Parenthood and the elimination of the Hyde amendments, uh, Hyde protections uh, in the Appropriations Bill, do you think that there will be an increase in in, in access to abortions? And is this a is, is this a desired effect of yours, Congressman? I think there, the, the, what's most important is that we all have access to the health care services that we need. And I will tell you that we'll do everything we can to make sure that women or men or children do not get denied access to important care. And we'll continue to follow the law as we do that. Okay. Finally, um, again, in your, you, you've supported the uh, president's budget. Um, one, of those, uh, one of those items would, uh, the, the Biden administration 
would prohibit funds being used or spent to on net on on stopping government networks from being able and government employees from being able to view, download, or exchange pornography. Is that a provision in the in the president's budget that you support? I think it's important given given the amount of uh, human trafficking at the border, particularly uh, and um, sex trafficking at the border. Do, do you support the Biden administration's push to prevent? Uh, I mean, to to allow government employees to work uh, while they're at work to to view pornography, download it, and exchange it. Congress, I, I will certainly say to you that uh, in this administration, we will not only uh, follow the law, but we'll make sure it's enforced. I know of no provision in the budget that would allow anyone in the federal government to uh, violate the law. Uh, no one has the authority to uh, download information which is illegal in nature. And so if you have well, some information- I'll, like I'll, be, I'll be happy to make I'll be happy to make sure that uh, that you get that information, the proposals that are in that are in that budget. Uh, so, you know, I worry about the elimination of cures that would save American lives, increasing funding uh, for abortions that uh, would take the life of the unborn and, and making sure that, uh, you know, that we keep uh, government employees from viewing uh, pornography on the taxpayer dime. You know, it sounds like y'all got a lot of work to do. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize a gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Secretary, welcome and congratulations to you. In recent years, we have been an increase of private equity purchasing hospitals and nursing homes. One stark example of this is in Philadelphia, was acquisition and eventually close of Hahnemann Hospital by the private equity firm, which is described in detail in the current issue of the New Yorker magazine. Mr. Chairman, I ask that unanimous consent to include this article entitled The Death of Hahnemann Hospital in the Record. As this article details, when private equity takes over, it is almost most the most vulnerable who bear the cost. So, Mr. Secretary, how do you view the ever expanding role of private equity in healthcare markets, and how can we incentivize Medicare and Medicaid to protect vulnerable safety net hospitals and people who serve serve them take over this? Congressman, thank you for the question. And I, what I can tell you is regardless of what your status, whether you're a provider, whether you're the federal government, uh, our, our first and foremost priority must be our patients. And for that reason, it is important that every program that uh, utilizes Medicare and Medicaid funding uh, follows federal health and safety standards. And so when it comes to any uh, uh, federal or any facility that uses federal funds, we're gonna make sure that they're accountable. And we don't wanna see them uh, taking advantage of safety net hospitals, uh, stripping them of their assets, and essentially leaving all those families behind. And so I look forward to working with you as Attorney General for the state of California. I was very aggressive, and I, I can show you the record I had in trying to make sure that if anyone wanted to buy a healthcare facility in my state, they better prove they were going to do it for the right reasons. Mr. Secretary, can you discuss the ways in which CMS will improve marketplace services? For consumers, how, how user fees allocated across the marketplace functions, and whether increase. Is the gentleman muted? and how user fees are being advocated. Chairman, I'm not able to hear Mr. Okay. Evans. Okay. Not able to hear the question. Mr. Evans, would you try the question again, please? Okay. Mr. Sick. I think, Dwight, you're having some technical difficulties there, so what we'll do is We'll call to Brad Schneider, and then we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Schneider. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Sir Secretary Becerra, for coming before the committee today. It is quite wonderful to see you again. Our country is in the midst of a long and difficult recovery. Congress and the Biden administration have already made historic investments to improve our economy and our health care system. And at the same time, as you noted in your opening statement, 
we are not out of the woods yet. President Biden's budget builds on these achievements and provides the continued funding and planning needed to realize the goals of the American Rescue Plan. In particular, I want to thank your agency and the administration as a whole for not just your focus, but your and the administration's prioritization of supply chain management as it relates to pandemic preparedness. I take note of the White House release today of its key findings on Executive Order 14017, America's Supply Chains, and the suggested creation of the Supply Chain Disruptions Task Force. As you may know, I've introduced legislation to create an office of supply chain resiliency, and I look forward to working with you and the administration to further advance this idea. Along the same lines, I remember back almost exactly 16, 16 months ago when I asked your predecessor, Secretary, Secretary Azar, about our critical supply chains in the face of the looming pandemic. Unfortunately, my fears at that time were fully realized in the months uh, succeeding that, and our supply chains failed to deliver vital products, namely personal protective equipment and testing supplies when our country needed them the most. Fortunately, since then, the Biden administration and Congress have made incredible progress in shoring up our supply chains, but we need continued planning and investment, not just for COVID, but for the next pandemic as well. Secretary Becerra, could you discuss your work to increase sustainable domestic production of supplies for the strategic national stockpile and what specifically we in Congress can do to help you achieve that goal? Congressman, great to see you and thank you for the question. This is an, this is an important one because we saw what happens when you're not prepared. And the last thing we have to do is make the mistakes of the past. And so our budget invests uh, pretty dramatically in uh, trying to make sure that our stockpile is is fit for the 21st century. We're going to try to make sure that we have those uh, private and public partnerships that are essential to make this work. We can't just do this by ourselves as a federal government. We need to turn to the private sector to make it happen. And so we look forward to working with Congress because we know we have a lot of work still to do to make sure that that supply chain is, is ready for the 21st century, uh, ready for prime time. And so we look forward to working with you, but we certainly should use COVID uh, to give us the, the lessons that we can learn from to do this better. Great, and uh, thank you. And I, I look forward to continuing working on you with you on this. In particular, another bill that was Senator Durbin, I introduced the PPP in America Act, which would very specifically produce domestic uh, PPE, PPE and testing supply production and promote, promote predictable, sustainable supply chains for this uh, strategic national stockpile. Uh, is that something that we can look to you um, to work together on? Look forward to working with you on that. Uh, thank you, and uh, in in the sake of time and, and uh, respecting your, your visit here, I appreciate you joining us, and I yield my, the balance of my time back. I thank the gentleman. Let's return to Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I recently in, reintroduced a bill called with iPods. I'm very pleased that President Biden's re request proposed to work with Congress on HPods. I look forward to working together. Mr. Secretary, can you explain why it is important to continue to expand the program? Congressman, forgive me. I, I, please uh, explain which program are we talking about? H pods. The, the health professional opportunity grant program. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, the health professionals opportunity grant program. Uh, listen, uh, here, if we're going to try to have the workforce and the healthcare system that we need for every community. We have to do what we can to expand those opportunities to make sure that our, our TANF recipients and other low-income individuals uh, with education and training uh, for occupations in the healthcare field can be out there for us. And so I, I think this is a way to make sure we're addressing not only our needs moving forward in terms of a workforce, but it's going to give opportunities to communities that oftentimes have been neglected. I thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Secretary, for that. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to inquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Secretary Becerra, for uh, appearing before the committee. You know, in, instead of setting our nation on a path for fiscal stability, I have a concern that this wasteful $6 trillion budget, which is the largest in our nation's history, would set us on a course for higher spending, more taxes, and runaway debt. It increases non-defense spending by 16% and puts the annual deficit at an average of $1.3 trillion per year for the next decade, doubling the national debt over the next 10 years. Results, the debt owed by each American are raising by 50% to around $120,000. I used to say that our children and grandchildren will be paying for our current lifestyle, 
But unfortunately, it's not going to be our great grandchildren that will bear the brunt of Washington's out of control spending. Instead of, a, instead of a, attempting to find common ground that both parties can agree on, the budget really does is about raising taxes on every American in order to pay for some of these uh, Democrat partisan socialist type policies. With all that massive spending in the budget, it's easy to overlook what the $6 trillion in spending doesn't address, basically safeguarding Medicare for seniors. We know that we're just five years away from Medicare insolvency, a frightening statistic by itself, but even more so after a global pandemic. And the trustees report for 2021 is significantly delayed. With so many unknowns regarding the true cost of COVID-19, it's very possible that insolvency accelerated significantly. Instead of protecting our current promise to seniors and fixing the insolvency issue, this budget fundamentally changes Medicare. It allows those 60 to 65 to start increasing Medicare spending and proposes adding significant new benefits such as vision and dental without any substantive and tangible changes to ensure the delivery of current services. As we struggle to overcome and recover from the global pandemic, it's more important than ever to help our families and small businesses recover and ensure that reckless spending in here in, in Washington doesn't jeopardize the, the promises we've made to seniors. Secretary Vicera, uh, you know, the fiscal 2022 uh, HHS budget would increase funding for NIH programs by 21%. Uh, it's been mentioned before that uh, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't any money going to uh, uh, grants for any of the gain of function uh, uh, spending in the next budget, but uh, we're kind of concerned about the uh, transparency and, and mischaracterizations of how some of the, the prior funding uh, was directed towards the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, that, that and, and we know they were in, involved in the gain of, fun, of function research, uh, which fundamentally changes uh, uh, what a virus can do. Uh, what we're hearing and understanding is that there was a direct grant of $600,000 and an additional $3.5 million of NIH funds uh, through uh, EcoHealth. Uh, can you confirm how much NIH spending went to the Wuhan Institute of uh, Virology, uh, whether directly or through other companies? Carson, thank you for the question. and. I'll simply uh, echo, repeat what Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins have said repeatedly, and that is that the NIH never approved funding for gain-of-function research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, we are doing everything we can to make sure that those who receive funding from the NIH are accountable for their funds. As I mentioned previously, the president has asked for an investigation about uh, the source of the virus, uh, the COVID-19 virus. Uh, as I said as well, I myself called for way before this became a controversy recently uh, for the World Health Organization to do a second stage of investigations into this. And so uh, I think, well, by the way, I should also mention that over the last several years, some 100 scientists have been prevented, stopped from doing research with the NIH over the course of time. And in some cases, we've actually prosecuted and convicted some of these individuals. But thank you, Secretary. I, I wish we had more time. Uh, I, I would I would put an echo in for some of the telehealth and making that permanent. Uh, but uh, I am out of time, so I will yield, yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Swazi, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't know if Lloyd Doggett is still on here, but I just want to thank him for pointing out that his state has one of the highest rates of uninsured children in the United States of America. And our state of New York, as well as the Secretary of State, have some of the the highest rates of insured children in the United States of America. And that's one of the reasons our state and local taxes are so high and why the SALT deduction is so important. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for joining us. I don't know if you remember, you met me back in 2016 when I was running for office. You said, you should really try and go on Ways and Means Committee. So I never thought it, I'd be so fortunate to be on this committee already, but I'm so grateful to be here and I'm so grateful for your, your service. Uh, thanks for everything you've done to defend the Affordable Care Act in, in, throughout your career. Uh, and I want to just bring up something that people don't talk that much about the Affordable Care Act. It's the Consumer Assistance Programs. It was in the original Affordable Care Act to provide money for state programs, state-based uh, uh, programs to help uh, consumers navigate the bureaucracy of health insurance. There's over 40 million denials of health insurance claims in 2019. Most people don't appeal that. Uh, my parents, I remember them dealing with the medical health insurance issues that have so hard waiting on the phone trying to navigate. Uh, now we have this uh, surprise billing protections that our chairman led the effort on along with uh, the ranking member. And, you know, people don't know they have those protections. So 
Uh, I led a letter earlier this year with a, a, about 30 of my colleagues uh, to the Appropriations Committee seeking $400 million to reinstate these consumer assistance programs that were defunded back in 2010. I want to know, would you help us support the idea of funding consumer assistance programs? Congressman first, great to see you and congratulations on being on a great committee with so many good colleagues. Uh, absolutely, we support that. The, this administration has already made major investments. We have provided eight full funding for the Navigator program, which helps a lot of consumers know what kind of pl uh, plan or policy to secure under the Affordable Care Act. We're, we've expanded the uh, outreach and marketing of the Affordable Care Act plans to consumers. And the result is over a million Americans in the last three months have signed up for new plans under the Affordable Care Act exchanges. We will continue to do that because we want Americans to be good consumers. And to do that, they need good information. So we'll work with you to make sure that that's done. So we want to try and get some more money put in specific for these state program, these state based programs. And I'm going to seek out your help in trying to help get that done. So thank you, Mr. Secretary. Really appreciate it. And thanks for your good advice. It's proven to be very helpful. Congratulations. To you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, to inquire. Hey, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for being here. It's great to see you. And, and uh, it was obviously unfortunate that uh, you left Congress the same year that I got in. Uh, but fortunate enough uh, for all of us that uh, you're in this position right now. And, and and we're in the position that you were in the last four years in California fighting for us here. And now you get to fight for everybody uh, across our country, especially when it comes to our health care and, and so many other things. So thank you very much. Uh, as you know, well, I come from the Central Coast of California and uh, being from California yourself, you know how important immigrants and obviously farm workers are. Uh, for, to our food security and who we are as a culture. Uh, obviously, throughout the pandemic, they were on the front lines and literally met the definition of what it means to be a essential worker, an essential worker, especially when it came to our food security. But um, unfortunately, at that expense, though, uh, you know, they were definitely susceptible to COVID-19. Uh, that is why I believe, and I'm sure you do too, it's absolutely critical that we prioritize vaccinating our farm workers. As demonstrated uh, in a recent Washington Post article on Sunday that actually talked about what we have done here in the Salinas Valley, the salad bowl of the world, uh, we actually came together. Uh, your help, especially getting us vaccines here, my advocacy, uh, the farm workers, the farmers, the federally qualified health clinics, all came together and we actually did our own little mass vaccine sites uh, that pretty much has, uh, it made sure that our farm workers are vaccinated or a significant amount of them are vaccinated right now. Obviously we need your continued help with that. And so Mr. Secretary, could you please describe other steps that HHS is taking to continue to address the unique health needs of both immigrant and farming communities? Congressman, first, uh, great to see you and thank you for continuing the great uh, Panetta tradition and what I can simply say is uh, wind me up when it comes to what you just said. Quite honestly, the, the best ideas I can tell you about are the ones that you all are coming up with back home. We want to piggyback on what you are doing because you know where your uh, families are that haven't been vaccinated. You know how to best reach them. You know who are, who are the most trusted voices, whether it's the clergyman or whether it's the wrestling coach or whether it's a neighborhood watch leader. You know who has the confidence of the people who are, haven't yet vaccinated. And so. We want to work with you. And when it comes to farm workers, my dad, having been a farm worker at one point in his life, let me tell you, if you've got some more good ideas on how to reach them, we are there. We are there. Outstanding. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And we do here and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, obviously, a big issue uh, as we get out of this pandemic and get onto the road to recovery is child care. And obviously, with the upcoming infrastructure package, uh, we want to make sure that we have certain infrastructure projects that address that. Can you share more about what sorts of physical infrastructure projects are needed to make child care facilities safe, affordable, and all, more importantly, available to all families? There's some great ideas that are out there in our communities. And what we want to do at the federal level is not impose our idea. We want to support and fund the good ideas that are out there. And so once again, what I would say is because you know your district, we want to work with you so that the resources that we hope will become available, some of them already available through the American Rescue Plan, 
but we hope the investments that would be made through the American Family Plan to help so many families to make sure kids have quality care uh, so their parents can work. We want to work with you because you know where the successful models are out there, and we want to make sure we're piggybacking so that they can grow. I was not long ago in Ohio visiting a tremendously effective child care center. They need to grow because they do it the right way. And so we want to build on what there is that can help all American families. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is an important hearing today. And, you know, one of the key, and, and, and Secretary Becerra, congratulations. You know, one of the key congressional responsibilities in the Constitution is the power of the purse. Every day, Americans. I have yet to do the full budget process since they have taken since they've taken majority in 2018. And when the president's budget was released, my constituents were furious to learn that he removes the Department of Health and Human Services ability to protect human life by removing the Hyde Amendment and spends more of their hard earned money to increase funding for abortion providers. This carelessness over taxpayer money comes on the heels of Congress appropriating nearly $4 trillion over the past year to fight the pandemic. And now that more than 130 million Americans are fully vaccinated, it's time for Congress to assess the spending impact. You know, one of the largest looming threats is the exhaustion of the Medicare trust fund. Spending to accommodate the pandemic depleted funds by an estimated $5.8 billion. The latest predictions show that Medicare funds will run out by 2024, two years earlier than previously expected. Without changes, they would have to hike Medicare payroll taxes by some 26% or cut benefits by 16% to make the program solvent. In other words, according to the nonpartisan CBO, if Congress doesn't act, benefits will need to be cut by $1,000 per beneficiary in order for our kids and grandkids to have access to the program that helps subsidize. Additionally, I'm concerned that we have no details about the administration's so-called reforms to the very popular Medicare Advantage program. My dear friend, the late Senator Tom Coburn, predicted long ago that each step the Democrats take to involve, be involved in health care was just a long-term plot to take away choice and inform government, enforce government-run health care. Unfortunately, I fear we're getting closer to this reality every single day. Not only does this budget get us closer to government-run health care and fails to address our looming debt crisis, but, but this budget also does not reflect American priorities. Last month, I introduced an RSC budget that not only balances in just five years, but provides solutions for the issues Americans care about, like border security, social security, and Medicare solvency, infrastructure, police and local safety, all of this without raising taxes. Americans are concerned about the economy and filling jobs, which President Biden's budget makes no mention of. Instead, it talks about abortion, climate control, price controls, and government subsidies that continue to incentivize people to stay out of the workforce. The Biden budget continues to provide fully paid health care for Biden's uh, America who chooses not to go back to work. It also supports expanded ACA sub subsidies, which will inevitably prolong the absolute avoidable unemployment issue. As a business person for 35 years, I know what it is to compete against the government when it comes to overregulation on the business community. I've witnessed firsthand how the Democrat Party sincerely believes that the best plan is to stick it to small businesses, the backbone of our economy, with their bloated spending bills. This is grossly misguided and will leave our kids and grandkids jobless and unable to pay the balance with zero benefits. Meanwhile, our jobs report continually reveals that our employers are struggling to fill jobs. Drive down any main street in America and you'll see a help wanted sign on the door. So why would President Biden continue with subsidies that incentivize employees to stay home? Mr. Secretary, last week a survey revealed that the unemployment for small businesses is at 48%, a 40-year high. Yet your budget proposes to continue COBRA subsidies and expand ACA subsidies, which makes it more appealing not to go back to work. Do you agree or disagree that Americans staying out of work is bad for the mental and physical health? Yes or no? Congressman, I know the time has expired, so I simply will tell you, we're, we're in the business of creating more jobs and getting more people at the health care they need, and we can follow up. And I do look forward to working with you since uh, we never had a chance. So I left and you came, and so hopefully we'll have a chance to work together in the future. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Gomez, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Secretary Becerra, it's good to see you. Well, welcome back virtually to the committee. Um, I don't really need to describe my district to you. Um, you're very familiar with it. But as, as you know, um, the district is a very complex district. It has uh, the haves and it has the have nots. It has people from all walks of life, um, from different backgrounds, uh, using different languages, um, getting around uh, by different means. And during the pandemic, we saw the impact of COVID-19 on the commu community that I represent um, that was disproportionate compared to other communities. First saw that in the data, as uh, you probably were aware, we, uh, that a lot of the COVID-19 tests were not taking place on the east side of Los Angeles, but on the west side. Um, we saw it on the infection rates. We saw it on the death rates. Um, I'm proud that we've been able to turn the page, but I believe it was certain it was foreseeable and our policymakers and our institutions and our programs just for some reason froze when it needed to um, turn uh, quickly and pivot towards a more equitable solution. Uh, we did that um, and I'm proud that California now has the lowest uh, infection rate uh, of any state in, in the country. But equity is, is key, but it's very hard to do, very hard to do. Um, no matter how much money you use, it's all about how you invest, how you target, and how you implement. And it's not always um, a straight line. And I like equity because it can impact so many different people from so many different um, uh, areas. And it's not, it's, it impacts people of color, but it also impacts um, uh, working class whites and rural areas as well. So um, I know the Health and Human Services budget focuses on advancing equity and reducing health disparities in all healthcare programs. Can you briefly describe these programs and their intended goals? And also how will you ensure these programs work in practice? Congressman, first, great to see you. Uh, I see uh, that, uh, that you, those, those digs look really familiar to me, uh, that, that office of yours. So I, I hope <laughs> you're taking good care of not just the office and your workers, but the district as well since uh, You've been able to come in and do a phenomenal job as the member of Congress for that district after I left. Yeah, somebody uh, left me some nice furniture when I, I took over. <laughs> Amen. Well, let, let me tell you that, uh, by the way, thank you for all your work on equity and trying to make sure that all communities are served. As you said, your our, our district, my former district, your current district, it, it's a tale of two cities in many, many ways, right? Uh, from wealth to poverty, but folks working together in many ways. I, I will tell you that President Biden has spoken not just about equity, but he's made it clear he wants to see results. And so at HHS, it's easy for me as a secretary to now say, we're gonna demand results as well from the people and the programs that we have at Health and Human Services. One of the things that we're doing, I have a couple of quick examples, the, the emphasis and the investment of real money into dealing with maternal mortality and morbidity. Um, you know, we can take for granted in the in the richest nation in the, in the world that we have access to health care. But you go to some communities and there are women who are dying as a result of their pregnancy and the women are having terrible outcomes as a result of the pregnancy. And it should surprise no one to know that happens mostly in communities of color. And so there are things that we're trying to do to address that. The investment that the president and I could follow up, but I apologize. I see the time has expired. First thought. Finish the thought, Mr. Secretary. Just going to mention Indian Health Services, the kind of investment that's being made in Indian Health Services. We're, we're going to make sure that we're out there reaching folks who, for the most part, have been in the shadows or in the corners of America. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Thank Let you, me sir. recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, to inquire. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And Secretary Becerra, it's great uh, to see you. Thank you for joining us today. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you have a great former staffer of mine, uh, Josie Villanueva Prescott. Uh, she has always done uh, great work and I know she's gonna do so with you and on behalf of the American people at, at uh, Health and Human Services. So please uh, tell her I said hi. Uh, Mr. Secretary, for my time, I'd, I'd like to talk about the importance of data collection. Uh, the chairman, uh, Chairman Neal has uh, designated uh, the Racial Equity Initiative Working Group within the committee. 
uh, which helps to ensure that policy proposals considered by the committee address economic and social inequities and advance racial justice, helping us create meaningful legislation that improves the lives of the people that we serve. But that that change, though, starts with paying attention uh, to the right metrics. We know that data collection and synthesis can change human behavior and the way that organizations operate. Simply put, if we want to improve something, we need to be able to measure it accurately. And if we can measure equity accurately, then we can clearly see the progress that we're making over time. To do that, we need to measure what matters. And I'm talking about demographic data. Collecting the right demographic me metrics will help us better understand the effect of structural racism and discrimination on health and economic well being. Uh, in your testimony, Mr. Secretary, you highlighted the COVID 19 pandemic has also shown the importance of producing reliable data. This Congress, I, I reintroduced uh, my bill, the Nursing Facility Quality Reporting Act of 2021, which would require the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to publish on the Nursing Home Compare website certain demographic information aggregated by state with respect to COVID-19 infections and deaths in such facilities. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in reference to the nursing home data bill, it's my understanding that this could also be done administratively. I'm a strong advocate for ensuring that we collect reliable race ethnicity data, particularly for our most vulnerable populations. And so given the administration's commitment to reducing health inequities, this would seem like an important part of an overall agenda. So Mr. Secretary, can you talk about what HHS's plans are to move forward on this issue? And can you describe the administration's plan to improve the underlying data systems at HHS with respect to how we collect race and ethnicity data and other vital indicators to track health inequities? Thank you. Congressman, great to see you and thank you for the question. Thanks for the work that you're doing on this issue. Uh, as I have said, I used to say this a lot when I was the Attorney General in California, we depended on data to drive so much of what we did. Uh, bad outputs produces, uh, excuse me, bad inputs produces bad outputs. And if you're going to rely on uh, on the research that's been done, but your data is flawed, you're going to start issuing really flawed conclusions and recommendations. And so we need to have good data to have good outcomes. And that's gonna permeate the work that we do at Health and Human Services because we know how important it is to have data that can go beyond the generalized uh, information that we often get. And you and I could talk about any number of uh, examples, diabetes. If we don't have clinical trials where we include the, all the populations, but especially the populations impacted by diabetes, and you know and I know that African-Americans, Latinos, oftentimes uh, we uh, are, that it affects us more than other communities. But if you don't have a, a clinical trial that includes surveys with those populations, your outputs, your results won't be very effective. So we need to work together to make sure we do this right. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Miller, to inquire. Thank you, Chairman Neal and Ranking Member Brady. And thank you, Secretary Becerra, for being here today. It's so nice to be able to meet you. You know, we all can agree that we want the best health care outcomes for America and access for care for all of those who need it the most at the most affordable price. However, we seem to have very different ways of accomplishing these goals. And instead of a top down government centric approach outlined by the administration's budget, I think we should focus rather on the patients, the cures and ensuring long term solvency for our health care system. Within this budget, the president has called on Congress to cut prescription drug prices. The plan, HR3, would result in fewer cures, as many as 100, I've heard, from entering into the market. And this legislation would completely chill American innovation, actually raising prices on seniors and cost American lives. We cannot let such a disastrous piece of legislation reach the president's desk. The Republican solution of H.R. 19 would lower the cost of drugs. 
increase pricing transparency and further American innovation. The COVID-19 pandemic has forever changed our healthcare landscape. Within West Virginia, who I represent, we saw many patients with increased access to care through telehealth. Given the extremely rural nature of my state, patients sometimes had to travel hours just to see a doctor. And through telehealth, they were able to pick up their phone and meet with their provider. I've heard from those providers who love it too, and they are able to see their patients more efficiently. I hope that we can take the lessons learned from telehealth during the pandemic and to continue funding telehealth. I think it's so important. Mr. Secretary, can you commit to keeping this committee up to date with regular updates on the status of the Provider Relief Fund, specifically on how much money has yet to be distributed and how much has been returned from the hospitals and providers, please? Congresswoman Miller, uh, first, if I could just say, I look forward to the chance to get to know you and work with you as you do your good work there in the House. And I hope that you can you feel comfortable turning to me and to the, the people on my team to work with you to help the people of West Virginia. Uh, on the Provider Relief Fund, we're going to do everything we can to be as transparent and as accountable as we can be. Much of the money has already been released. But what we're going to do with the money that remains is try to show you how it will be spent right, how it's going to be allocated properly. And hopefully we're working with the providers that are in line to get some of that relief to make sure that they get it in time and they document as well what they've done with the money. So you and I can both say that the taxpayers made a good investment in helping some of these providers who were there on the front lines, helping Americans recover from COVID. Okay, thanks. West Virginia is such an incredible rural state. I don't know if you've ever been there before. It's beautiful. But telehealth across all specialties has really played a crucial role in during the pandemic in ensuring a timely and a quality access for us to have care. Given this increased access to care for our most poor, vulnerable, and elderly patients, what is the administration's plan to expand telehealth after the public health emergency ends? We're looking to take the lessons from COVID that showed how telehealth became so important and working with you provide more flexibility, but more accountability so we can make sure we can get to folks in America. And we wanna make sure that broadband is available to everyone. That's wonderful. I have another issue. You know, the budget, am I cut off? <laughs> Not cut off, but your time has expired. <laughs> okay, well, I'll ask you some more questions. Maybe I'll send you a letter. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, to inquire. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I'm so honored and excited uh, to have the secretary with us as having uh, had him as a mentor when he was a member of the House, to see him in this position and know the leadership that he's going to bring to the agency is something I know that we're all looking forward to. Um, Mr. Secretary, I have a number of questions for you. Uh, and just wanted to surmise some of them, summarize some of those uh, related to the territories and hoping that you could give your commitment to work with our office and the other territories regarding healthcare disparities. As I'm sure you're aware, the territories are again in limbo as they face the upcoming fiscal cliff in Medicaid programs at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, the administration has done a great deal, and this Congress has supported the territories in eliminating the disparities that we have, not only in um, our funding caps, as well as in the share between the federal government and hospitals is, and um, local governments as well. But also, and one that we don't talk about as much, is the exclusion of the American residents living in territories excluded from low-income subsidies for Medicare prescription drug benefits, as well as to the disproportionate share per hospitals DISH program under Medicaid and Medicare, in spite of the significant amount of uncompensated care um, and the number of individuals in rural areas in uh, the territories. And I was hoping that you would look at some of these issues and make a commitment with to work with our, my office as well as other territories in this committee to find permanent solutions 
to some of those uh, disparities. Congressman, first, uh, great to see you. Secondly, it was great to actually see you in person just a couple of weeks back. And I look forward to getting to do that more often. Uh, let me tell you, I, I think you know from my work when I was a colleague that the territories deserve to have our attention. You know that the president's budget has uh, support for eliminating the Medicaid funding caps for U.S. territories and tries to make sure we can align matching rates with states. Uh, and so we, I look forward to working with you because folks in the territories work very hard. We have to match that work effort to make sure we can address these needs. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is with regard to temporary assistance for needy families, TANF, and particularly the national TANF issues. Do you believe that TANF funding levels or allocation of funds to states should be altered to account for changed circumstances, inflation, poverty, population? Um, what are your thoughts with regard to um, funding levels and allocations of TANF? Congresswoman, TANF is a program that's supposed to meet the needs of our neediest families. And so we have to make sure that whatever our statutory framework is or anything we do through regulations, it's directed at trying to meet the neediest families. Every once in a while, that means you probably have to make adjustments so that you have refined your approach. And so we're more than willing to work with you and others if you think there's a better way to do this, because we want to make sure at the end of the day, our resources are reaching the most needy families. Well, you know, I know that this has been an issue during the pandemic as work requirements and time limits on age, um, you know, should some TANF rules be suspended during the pandemic. But then once the pandemic ends, should those changes be made to work requirements to prompt states to engage additional unemployment recipients and activities? Or should the changes be made to alter the share of eligible families receiving assistance? Did you have any policy ideas or thoughts for this Congress on how we address the most neediest families in our country? Congressman, I know the time has expired, so I'll simply say this and we can follow up. We want to work with you. If you think there are ways that we can move forward to address the needs of these families post-COVID-19, we're, we're willing to work with you and we look forward to seeing if there's some good solutions. I thank the gentle lady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Schmucker, to inquire. With the gentleman on mute. There, can you hear me now? We can hear you. All right, well, All right. thank you, Mr. Chairman, Secretary. Thank you for uh, testifying before us here today. Uh, you know, I, I have some real concerns with uh, President Biden's uh, budget. I think it manages to raise taxes on middle and low income Americans while uh, simultaneously in a position where I think we're headed toward not being able to to make good on our promises on a path to bankruptcy. Um, so I really want to be sure that the American people are hearing this. So I'll say it again. I, this budget raises taxes on all Americans including those who the president said he wouldn't raise taxes on. And we know that uh, even the money raised through this is still not enough to pay for all the proposals in the budget. Uh, this budget includes a provision to create a public option, uh, coupled with the 163 billion in subsidies in the plan to try to make uh, Obamacare plans more affordable. Both proposals do nothing to lower the actual cost of health care to boost innovation or to improve access. And uh, what's more, the budget includes promises to seniors by expanding Medicare fee-for-service benefits without having the money pay for those new benefits. And I'm concerned that will further erode Medicare solvency and drive up premiums in the Medicare Advantage plans. These ideas in this budget are bringing our nation one step closer to adopting a healthcare model that's used in socialist countries. And I believe that socialist medicine means fewer cures, fewer cures and delayed or worse, even denied care. Uh, coverage does not equal access. There's a lot that we can do to improve access. And uh, by the way, I want to mention telehealth has been mentioned uh, many times in this hearing. Uh, and I want to share one unique use from my district. I represent Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, which is home to uh, tens of thousands of Amish, Amish constituents. And I'm sure you're aware that they don't typically use uh, 
electronics, but even among the Amish, some seek necessary care during the pandemic engaged in what they do is audio only telehealth visits. So telehealth is helping to reach underserved communities throughout the nation, even populations like the Amish in my area. So if there's one area of bipartisan work that can be accomplished this year, I you know, hope to work with the administration uh, to make sure that we can continue to provide the access that telehealth has provided and that that doesn't go away at the expiration of the public health emergency. But uh, Secretary, a public option is really a partial government takeover of our healthcare system. And I, as I mentioned, I fear that will undermine the employer sponsored market and threaten Medicare solvencies uh, providers are already facing cuts to their reimbursement rates, and they'll be forced to charge the private market more just to make up for insufficient government pay payments. And in turn, 157 million Americans, by the way, currently obtain their coverage through the private market. Uh, they, they will likely see their premiums rise, including seniors on fixed income. And in the meantime, none of this makes a single improvement to the quality of care. We'll be pressuring physicians and hospitals to do more for less. And I fear that this will result in upheaval of the healthcare market. Uh, and in fact, it might be the intent to quickly force us all into Medicare for all. But a quick question, do you agree that the underlying budget will let the tax cuts enacted under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act for middle and low income Americans expire? Congressman, uh, thank you for the question. I do look forward to, to, to working with you in the future. Uh, please make sure you reach out to my my team if we can be helpful on anything. Uh, I, the president's budget actually increases the opportunities for middle income uh, families. And I hope that what we have a chance to, since my time has expired, is to go into some of that in detail. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. I wanna thank uh, Secretary Becerra for joining us today. I know he's on his way to, to the other chamber, uh, but as an alum, you'll be pleased to note that we think he'd be better off staying over here with us. <laughs> Uh, please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the Ways and Means Committee stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr.